and I'm seeing 10 o'clock on the official clock and on my telephone, so I say we start. And I can see that we have 78 people joining us today, so that's fantastic. We really appreciate your time. We have a lot of material for you. We're going to move quickly, and I think we'll have a lot of fun. You're going to see some stuff. You're going to see a presentation that is one of a kind, has never been given before, and you'll get to see our chef demo some equipment. So uh, let's leap right in. First off, my name is Richard Young, and I'm a director at the Frontier Energy Food Service Technology Center. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do at the Food Service Technology Center. But first, I want to introduce my co-presenter today, which is, uh, that's Chef Mark Dusler. Mark is our consulting chef. He has, you know, a couple of decades of hard living in the trenches in kitchens and came to a, one of our classes and said, hey, can I join you guys? And we said, yes, we're a bunch of engineers. We'd love to have a chef. So now you have the engineer and the chef, so that means the world is balanced. Mark and I do both work at this cool place called the Food Service Technology Center. The Food Service Technology Center is an unbiased research and training facility that's in San Ramon, California. We have been in operation almost 35 years. In 2022, that'll be our 35th anniversary, and I've been there about 33 of those years. And we basically have four core functions. The first and most important thing that we do is we have an appliance test lab. We joke that we're the NASA of commercial food service, which makes everybody giggle, but in some ways it's true because there's nobody else that does quite what we do. And so we have these very precision test standards that we apply to equipment. That's how we can give you such great advice. Then we also do a lot of field research. We go out and we see how things uh, operate in the real world. You take the lab and the field research, put them together. You have a really good idea of how energy uh, use roles and how pieces of equipment perform. Then we take all that nerdy stuff and we give it back to you, our customers, through site surveys, consultations. All this information is no good if we can't share it. And then we also do bigger picture workforce education and training, which is what we're doing today. We're taking this knowledge and sharing it out to everybody. And it would be no good if you didn't join us. So we're really, really very thankful that you joined us. And we're gonna share a bunch of interesting stuff today. And I do want to mention one thing. You saw that I mentioned in the last slide, we are an unbiased facility. The other thing is that we're fuel agnostic. We're a fuel agnostic mission driven team. And what do I mean by fuel agnostic? Electricity, gas, hydrogen, renewable natural gas, unicorn tears. We don't care what the fuel is as long as it cuts carbon. OK, so we're fuel agnostic, agnostic mission driven team and our mission is cutting carbon. And that's what we want to help you with is to cut carbon in your commercial kitchens. Now I have a couple of slides I have to put up just as sort of the, the fine print. First thing is to let you know that today's class is funded by California utility customers. That's you, it's administra it is administered by PG&E and it's under the auspices of the California Public Utilities Commission. So this is basically a publicly funded class that's administered by PG&E and thanks to PG&E for sponsoring today's class. Also, here's a great disclaimer. You can, if you come back and watch the video, you can pause this and read it in detail, but it's a, it's a typical disclaimer. It basically says everything we tell you today is to the best of our knowledge. And if we make some mistake, please don't hold it against us, but we're gonna give you everything that we can the best way we know. And with 35 years of knowledge, we have pretty good, uh, pretty good knowledge base there. Also being a pg and &E and a utility, we like to do safety messages before every seminar, before every class. Safety is super important both to um, pg and &E and to Frontier Energy. I'm the safety guy at Frontier Energy. So one of those things that I want people to be careful about as we finish out our summer in California when often it gets the hottest is heat exhaustion and heat stroke. And I can just tell you it is very, very easy to have heat exhaustion and very easy for that to turn into heat stroke. Just about six weeks ago, there was a very experienced runner who took a run out in Pleasanton, not very far from our lab. He ended up with heat exhaustion and got disoriented and died just a little bit, you know, a couple hundred feet off the trail. We don't want that to happen to you. And of course, anybody who's in a kitchen, which is even hotter, that's hot every day of the year. So please be safe. Drink water, take a break. Do not risk yourself. It's very easy to get heat exhaustion. All right, there's our safety message. A little housekeeping. We are gonna ask you to participate in a short survey at the end of the class. And in the, the Q&A box, you'll see the link to that survey. It's super important to us. It's one of our deliverables for this class is to, is to get your opinion on how, how well it wor worked and other subjects that you would like. So when we get to the end, please stick around and take that survey. 
Um, also, this class will be recorded and posted on the DGS site, and we will also uh, record it and post it on the very site that you uh, registered with on the PGD site as well, the PGD Learning Management System. So we want you to come back share this class, share the handouts. We've actually put the handouts also in that question box. So you can download those right now if you like. This is public information, please get it out there. And we want this to be interactive. We want you to ask questions. So in your Teams Live, you'll notice the little, the two little kind of text bubbles up there and one of them has a question mark in it. That's how you're gonna type in the questions and I'll be able to have a look at them over here and, and we'll take a break between each sort of section and have a look at your questions and answer those back for you. We have some learning goals today. We're gonna to try to explain what induction is or, or when you walk away from here, we want you to be able to explain what induction is and how it works. We want you to be able to describe what technologies are available for all electric kitchens. Uh, you should be able to discuss how induction in all electric kitchens can help create a cooler kitchen and save some labor, enable more scratch cooking. And you should also know how to receive design assistance, okay? We're giving you a bunch of information. There's a couple of important things that we ultimately want you to walk away with, which is how do I get back to this information? How do I get available resources? How do I get help? We don't want you to have to do all of this stuff alone, and we're here to help. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to Ida Claire, who's gonna give an opening message. So Ida, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard. I'm really thrilled with this presentation today. It wasn't uh, very long ago, early this year, where I saw a presentation for the City of Sacramento because City of Sacramento was going to all electric appliances and Frontier Energy put that on and Chef Mark Dusler and I was very impressed. So I got on the phone and I said, please create one for our schools. And they said, absolutely, let me reach out to PG&E. And they did. And so this is uh, the result of that work. DSA did very little other than the phone call. So we are greatly appreciative to PG&E, to Richard Young, to Michael Cars, to Kiana Cobbin, and to Mark Dusler for bringing this presentation to all our school districts live. This is part of DSA's Education and Outreach Program for Sustainability. Our goal is to move California public schools into a net zero energy and zero carbon future. We hope to bring more information to you shortly, including the launch of another cohort to uh, get to zero net energy and zero carbon. A little bit of information that's going on at DSA, our 2022 Cal Green rulemaking is now in its 45 day com public comment period. That public comment period runs from August 13th through September 27th. There are some measures on there that affect our public schools. There are clarification for requirements on shade trees in Cal Green. There are requirements for CO2 monitors in new classrooms for K-12. And also the requirement for electric vehicle charging station infrastructure on 20% of parking spaces and the inclusion of chargers on 5% of the EV capable spaces. Again, that's for new parking facilities in addition to parking facilities, and that applies to K-12 public schools and community colleges, and of course, new campuses. So please uh, reach out in our 45 day public comment period on Cal Green. This is your opportunity to participate on the sustainability regulations that are in Cal Green that affect you. Obviously, we take comments in support and against the proposals. We are required to respond to each comment. Again, this is part of the public participation process before the regulations are heard in front of the Building Standards Commission later this year. Also, another update of the Energy 2022 Energy Code was approved by the California Energy Commission on August 11th. And those are four regulations that will take effect January 1st, 2020. Three. And so that is also moving forward to a big step towards building electrification. You can check out those regulations on the California Energy Commission website. One more Energy Commission notice that acceptance testing technician certification provider program will be required for all projects submitted and approved to DSA. After October 1st, it requires certified acceptance testing technicians to be used to close out projects, and that applies to indoor and outdoor lighting and controls and applies to HVAC systems and controls. And it's very important this happens. It ensures that an independent um, evaluator ensures that your project is performing as designed and that it is performing in accordance with the energy code. Again, that will be required for all projects 
after October 1st, 2021. This presentation, as well as many others, will be moving into our new DSA Academy, which is our new learning management system. So we will be sending out notices when this presentation is available on our LMS, in addition to other presentations that we will create for sustainability and accessibility. To stay informed, please subscribe to DSA's listserv if you go to www.dgs.ca.gov slash DSA all the way to the bottom of the page. You will see a subscribe button and you can subscribe to our information and be abreast of what DSA has going on in our education and outreach program, and also any other pertinent information with your plan review and approval for your projects by subscribing to our listserv. So with that note, I'm going to pass that this back on to Richard. Again, Richard, thank you so much for bringing this presentation, and I just want to thank all of you who are in attendance. It shows that you too are ready for a net zero energy and carbon free future. Richard. Great. Thank you so, so much, Ida. And it's it's a pleasure to hear from you. And yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that today's class is sort of one of many that we'll be able to help you out with because there's lots of subjects and lots of ground to cover. And for everybody who's just joined us, and we've, we have a bunch of people who have joined us in the last couple of minutes. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot of good information today, and let me just give you a, a quick agenda or a breakdown of how we're going to run this. I'm going to start out, me the talking head with some slides. You're going to see some PowerPoint slides, and I'll give you big picture stuff. I've got a couple of videos of Chef Mark, and we'll roll through sort of big picture issues, and I'll, I will invite you to ask questions. Then we'll take a break, and we will go live to the uh, Food Service Technology Center's demo space, and Chef Mark will actually show you some of the equipment and then he's going to demo a, an induction cooktop and same thing will take your questions. And we have a lot packed into, you know, all the way, we can run all the way up to, to noon if we need to. A lot of packed into, a, into this time frame, but we also know that we have very educated people online. And so that's how we can kind of move quickly because we know you're gonna be able to absorb this. And we also know that we're gonna give you information on how to get back to us so that if you didn't understand something or you need help, you can contact us and we can help you out. So let's leap right in chapter one and talk about kitchen electrification. This thing, I gotta tell you, this has been, this is the hot topic now for you know my 33 years at the Food Service Technology Center. We've been trying to say, pay attention to the kitchen, pay attention to the kitchen. And then, and most of the time, you know, nobody would pay attention to the kitchen. The architects and the mechanicals and everybody else on a building project would be like, eh, it's just a kitchen. And suddenly decarbonization has made, you know, kitchen sexy again. So we're really thrilled. And, and the good news is we've had all these, you know, three decades to grab information, and save it up. So now we have a lot to talk about. So let's, let's move right into it. And I see four big picture drivers of, of school kitchen change. And and in our capacity at the Food Service Technology Center, we talk to a lot of different people on the technical side, on the sustainability side, operations side. So, so I see, you know, at least four things that are really going to, the, the school kitchens change, that it's going to change the, the business as usual. It's going to be no business as usual. So the first one is scratch cooking, right? We've been talking about this now for at least a decade. This is on the, on the rails, right? This train is moving down the track. It's going to happen. So scratch cooking means that we have to rethink the way that we design and run our, our school kitchens. Then the, the second big item is the fact that the governor has now said, you know, there will be meals for all kids. Now, I have four children. All four of them went through public schools. So I kind of know about, you know, pu public. And I live in Oakland, so it's all Oakland public schools. Go Oakland, right? And, I, and so I kind of know how the meals program works. And my personal feeling is that having every kid now getting a couple of meals a day is gonna change the demand for those meals and also the, the scrutiny of the quality of those meals and is going to require school kitchens to do you know, their, their uh, best job to put out really quality meals. The other issue is labor. All across commercial food service, people are having trouble finding anybody to work in a kitchen. And I know within the school districts, that even if you can find somebody to work in the kitchen, then the difficulty of getting them under contract and bringing them on is truly a pain, right? So we all have to do more in less space with fewer people. So labor is a huge issue. And then of course, as Ida just pointed out, there's the notion of decarbonization. We need to get to zero carbon, right? Net zero carbon is in our future. It has to happen, which means once again, we have to rethink 
these schools, uh, school kitchens, which are typically very energy dense, very high EUIs, and you know they're little factories underneath your roof. So, so let's talk about this and the kind of the change that has to happen. If we just look at you know from the ten thousand foot level, the change that has to happen is we have to go away from that traditional cook line that was you know it, it really hasn't evolved much since World War II. That's kind of when we learned to big build build big kitchens. It was World War II. We needed to feed a lot of people. And we came back and brought those, you know, technologies and, and that design approach to our rapidly growing, you know, commercial kitchens in, in the United States. And the, and the philosophy was we have plenty of space and let's just buy one of everything. And that worked great up until now. Now we need, we don't have plenty of space. We need to reduce the space of our kitchens. We need them to be fast, small, and flexible. And we need to do more cooking and safer cooking with fewer people, right? So our vision is to take that that old school kitchen, shrink it down and be able to handle a lot of food production with, you know, maybe fewer workers, maybe one really good professional who can run all of the automation, these high tech pieces of equipment and produce a lot of food safely. And this is all very realistic. This is not like science fiction. This is in fact, the sort of the pathway that they've been following in Europe for many, many years. So kind of ultimately we need to take our American kitchens and and make them a little bit more like European kitchens while also bringing in all this new technology, much of which is, is European as well. So that's where we're going, that's our big picture. So let's do a couple of quick definitions. And I know, you know, I'm just gonna touch on this briefly, decarbonization. I like to just put that definition down so we're all on the same page. And you know, de decarbonization is reducing human related carbon and CO2 equivalents in all aspects of human society. Okay, so de decarbonization is reducing human related carbon. Ultimately, we want to, you know, completely reduce the, hum the human related carbon to zero, right? We want to reach zero net carbon. But decarbonization is, is really defined as reducing at the moment. And I mentioned that because I want to show you something. This is a study we did at some universities, hotels, hospitals, where we replaced the existing gas convection ovens, many of which you have similar models in your school kitchens. And we replaced those with our best in quality energy efficient gas ovens, okay? And what did we find in almost every case, we reduced the carbon by anywhere from a half to two thirds, all right? And, and big numbers, right? Each one of these six tons, seven tons, 11 tons, that's tons of carbon per year, you know, with one or two ovens in one facility. They're massive numbers. But I mention this because this was totally cost effective. There are rebates for all of this the energy reductions actually paid for the cost of the equipment over the lifetime of the equipment. So this is a way to decarbonize kind of immediately. And we'll come back to that point in a minute, but I just am opening up the big, the big picture here. Now let's talk electrification. Decarbonization and electrification are related, but they are not the same thing. And electrification is simply defined as replacing technologies that consume fossil fuels with technologies that consume electricity. Okay, so Ida, you're gonna to have to give up your Ferrari and get the Tesla, but I bet you've already done that. And in your kitchen, it means giving up your old, you know, 19th century technology gas range and moving to the 21st and induction cooktops. That's, that's what we're talking about with electrification. So here's our first kind of major takeaway, okay? Electrification is the future and, we, and it will get us to zero net carbon and we have to get to zero net carbon. And that's really what we're gonna mostly talk about today, but, I just want to say, you know, from the engineer in me, and remember our mission at the Food Service Technology Center is decarbonization. It's cutting carbon, okay? So the engineer in me says, right now, this moment, if you have a kitchen and they need equipment and you don't have the funds to do a total rehab, make sure you buy the most efficient uh, gas equipment to replace the equipment that's broken or coming out. You can achieve significant decarbonization simply by applying the energy efficiency techniques and the equipment that we already have in hand. So we don't always have to be, you know, tossing this ball into the future, oh, we'll electrify everything. We're gonna do both at the same time, okay? So major takeaway, anytime you see a slide, it's all black and white writing on it like that, that's one of those ones that you want to take a note of. One of my slides you want to take a note of. All right. So electrification means all electric kitchens. Oh my goodness, this is different, right? So there's going to be some challenges for commercial food service. And one of those challenges is that we're going to require some behavior change. People in kitchens, they kind of got their habits. They, they you know, train on this equipment. They want to work on it forever. So we are going to have to change some behavior. Oh my God, can we do that? I think we can, particularly as we show people 
you know, better equipment, we give them better choices. It doesn't take that long to make to change behavior if you can get people working on something that they like. Here's another challenge that, that is really more related to independent restaurants than your school food service. Electricity is a more expensive fuel than gas, okay? But I don't see that as a huge problem in schools because once again, your overall operating cost is much, much bigger than the cost of just that kitchen. If, it, if this was a mom and pop restaurant and they had one restaurant and their electricity go, bill goes up by, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars a year, that could break them, that can put them out of business. But you are in a long game business and, uh, you know, a little more cost of electricity is not going to kill you. And ultimately, our goal is to figure out how to do that design in your kitchen so that your utility costs don't rise that much and that you actually save on, you know, labor with your new equipment and you have a more comfortable kitchen. So both of these challenges, I think, could be overcome, right? Here's one of the first things is many appliances that are already in your school kitchens require no behavior change at all to go to all electric. For example, let's see, and I can do a little, I use my pointer here if I can get it going. This is a griddle, let's see, where's my pointer? There we go. Here we have a griddle. You, can, you couldn't tell if it was gas or electric, there's no way. Fryers, you know, same thing. The performance is exactly the same. Convection ovens, most people in a kitchen wouldn't know whether a convection oven is gas or electric. You know, we know because we go back there and see there's a little stack on the back of the on the back of the the gas ones. Steamers, same thing. You know, more griddles. Come up in the right right corner of your uh, Teams Live. There's a little question mark. You know, a little little caption bubble up there. You can type your questions in there, and we'll we'll take more breaks and look back at questions. But okay, that's that's our beginning piece here. So let's move into chapter two. Let's focus more on induction cooking. Let's dig right into that technology that I'm I'm telling you is the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? Better than sliced bread. So what is induction? Let, let's just talk some theory real quickly. You see my, my drawing over here, and I apologize, I'm left-handed. I'm actually using the mouse right-handed today. So, and, and even when I use it left-handed, I'm still lousy. I'm still a lousy drawer, <laughs> but anyhow, let's, let's look at this. So I have my diagram. You can see that I have these coils here. These little um, orange babies are my coils, copper. And I'm going to run some electric current through those coils. And I'm also going to just stop trying to draw on it. Running some electric current through that coils. And then the purple rings, that's an, a magnetic field that is induced by those coils. And that magnetic field, it, it sits up above a glass ceramic top, okay? So it's radiating up, but it doesn't have anything to do. It's just sitting there. It can't affect anything until I put something that is ferromagnetic, which is a piece of cookware that is actually magnet or can be magnetic, a magnet will stick to it. I put that into that magnetic field and that starts to agitate the electrons in the metal and it heats up the pot, okay? So I have a very efficient heat transfer and all the heat transfer happens in the pot and then it's the pot that cooks the food. It's not a flame, it's not an element underneath, it's the pot itself. So highly controllable, reduced heat to the space, a combination ovens, kettles, all of these pieces of equipment. If you took your, your cook who's working in kitchen A that's, that's all gas and you took them over to kitchen B that's all electric and said, cook the same meal, and they had the equivalent, you know, every manufacturer, like every, every griddle manufacturer makes a gas and electric version of the griddle. The person who went to the all electric kitchen would cook the pancakes, they'd be the same, they would never notice. So that's a huge win for us. So right there, just take a deep breath because this is a lot of your kitchens. This is equipment that you have, not necessarily fryers. I don't think you're cooking too many fries. Um, and then here's another thing, as kitchen equipment evolves, we tend to be moving towards smaller and faster equipment and all of that is electric equipment, okay? So when you go on the Starbucks and they're knocking out those little breakfast sandwiches and cookies and things out of their high-speed ovens, all electric equipment. So the trends are already moving in that direction. So we have the wind at our sails when it comes down to that. And then here's the thing, you know, like our biggest worry that the big, the big sort of like, oh my God, I can't do it you know, point is, can I give up my gas range top? What'll happen to me if I can't see a flame? You know, don't worry about that because induction cooking is a superior technology in, in every way. And as soon as we get people working on induction cooktops, they, they're they not going to go back to the gas cooktops. They, they People are going to bone a little bit, right? Oh, you know, what what's going to happen? The world's going to end. And then as soon as you give them the new, the new thing, they go like, oh, this is awesome. I'm never going back. Just like our smartphones, you know, like 
there were those of us who were like, yeah, my flip phone works fine. I just need a phone. And now it's like, who uses a phone? I'm, I have this computer in my hand. That's where we're headed. I want to stop just for a moment and see if there are any questions this is the end of sort of this big picture chapter, and I'm not seeing anything yet. So remember, if you do have questions, really a superior technology in so many ways, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. I've got a couple of videos here that we recorded for an on-demand class, uh, a full-on on-demand commercial induction class, and you can go back and watch that for free. It's, it's on-demand in the PG&E site that you signed up for. But anyway, let's, let's watch a couple of these little videos as uh, Chef Mark talks some about induction cooking. I'd like to introduce you to the Food Service Technology Center's consulting chef, Chef Mark Dusler. Chef Mark has removed the glass top on the tabletop induction unit to expose the induction coil. Let's see what Chef Mark has to say. Induction cooking technology operates on an entirely different principle. In front of me, you'll see an exposed induction cooktop. When using induction, the pan itself is the heat source. This is achieved by alternating magnetic fields generated by a copper coil. The molecules within the pan are excited, which produces heat energy. Because the cooking vessel itself is the heat source, we don't have the inefficiencies associated with the heat being transferred from one source to another. Let's have a closer look at the exposed insides of that induction cooktop. If you notice, right in the center of the coil, there's a temperature sensor, and that temperature sensor is glued right against the ceramic glass top of the cooktop. What that means is that the induction control system is able to measure the temperature of the glass cooktop, which is the same as the temperature of the pan, and of course that means it's the same as the temperature of the food. So that means that you can have very precise temperature control. As I mentioned earlier, with induction cooking, only the pan heats up and not the cooktop. One of the most fun ways to demonstrate that is with this chocolate test. Let's watch Mark as he breaks some chocolate, sets the temperature on the induction cooktop, and then shows us the result. Here we can see how the induction unit only interacts with the metal pan. The chocolate in the pan begins to melt, while the chocolate on the cooktop remains cool and solid. Having such precise temperature controls means that processes like double boilers used for tempering chocolate and eggs may not be necessary. So there you have it. A couple of cool things about induction. I think, once again, I think the coolest thing ever is just that the pan is what heats up and not the cooktop. And that's also the thing that requires the most mental shift for us because most of us have never worked with induction before and have never worked with something that you know where it's where the heat isn't coming from some source below the heat's actually in the pan oops that one moved far on me so there's always the question about what kind of cookware do i have to get super special cookware most of your cookware will probably already work the way to tell is just get a magnet get a fridge magnet if it sticks it works if you're buying new cookware there's an induction ready symbol out there if it's cast iron pans they work fine an awful lot of stainless has enough iron in it that it's magnetic that it will work and the one place that falls down is if you have those really cheap aluminum pots, they're not magnetic, they won't work. But the cookware element is not that big a deal. And also within your school kitchens, you probably are going to tend to a little better cookware anyway. And Mark will probably talk about that some when he dem demos his omelet a little bit later on. So we talked about what induction is. Let's kind of talk about what it's not, because induction is not the conventional electric range top. And that's good because all of us who have had experience with a conventional electric, you know, range top know that we don't really like those things. Okay, so traditional range tops use a resistive element. It heats uh, as electrical current passes through the element. So it takes a little while to get up. And then the heat is transferred from that element into the food through the pan, right? So it's conduction. The pan has to sit down on that element. If the element's warped, then you don't get very good heat transfer. It's just kind of slow. And then because the heating element it is slow, it tends to overshoot its set point. It tends to go, I set it at 200 degrees and it tends to want to go up to like 215 degrees. So it makes it hard to really control it. And then when I turn the heat down, it takes a long time for it to give the heat up. So the traditional electric range tops, not very cool. And I don't blame people for, for not liking those because they don't perform very well. Induction is totally different, okay? So let's compare an induction hob, a gas burner, and an electric element because once again, 
the notion is folks think like, I'm going to give up the gas burner. I'm going to give up, you know, my heat up time, my temperature response and all these great things that you get out of a gas burner. And no, the induction hob actually performs a little more like the gas burner. So, you know, for fast heat up, the induction hob heats super fast. The gas burner heats super fast. The electrical element takes a long time to come up to temperature. How about quick temperature response? If I turn a burner down, you see the flame go down, you know the heat has dropped off. The induction hob actually responds faster than the gas burner because there's no residual heat there, right? There's no big chunk of metal that's hot. It's just a glass top. The electric element has terrible turn down, terrible uh, temperature response because it has to, it's got a lot of stored heat in that element. And that's the quick cool down as well. If I take the pot off the induction hob, it cools down super fast. There's a little residual heat in the glass just from the pan itself. If I'm boiling something at 212, then the glass will be at 212, right? But it gives that heat up super fast. A gas burner gives the heat up pretty fast, although that piece of metal can stay hot for a while, but an electric element stays hot forever. So you have, you know, fire risk and burn risk with the electric element. And then sauteing, yeah, you can saute, you know, that everybody wants to saute on the gas burner. It's kind of sexy, you see the flame. If you're thinking I can't do it on an induction hob, absolutely you can saute on an induction hob because you essentially have this electromagnetic field that's rising above the glass and you're just moving the pan in that area, right? Electric element, you can't saute because that, that requires conduction. The pan has to touch to, to have the heat transfer through, but with induction, the heat keeps transferring through even if you raise the pan a little bit off the glass surface, right? So induction hob matches the gas burner for speed, flexibility, everything. Now let's talk a few non-energy benefits like safety and time savings, okay? And here's another couple. Because the induction cooktop has advanced control circuitry, it can sense whether the, there's a potter pan on its surface. And when the potter pan is removed, it can actually turn the power off to the unit. And we're going to demonstrate that now with this residential version of an induction Oops. cooktop. This one has blue LEDs to emulate a blue flame. And you can see as Chef Mark lifts the pan, it turns off the power. And in fact, when he sets the pan back on, it will turn the power back on again. And you can see the water came back to a rapid boil. Some added benefits to cooking with induction would be that we have no convective heat coming around the pan. What this means is that we don't need a towel when grabbing the handle here. And because the heat is being generated by the pan itself, we have very little heat transfer back into the glass top as demonstrated with this towel. As you can see, we are still cooking, but there's no burning of the towel. The solid glass top surface makes it safe and easy to clean. So um, just going back to that last video, I'm kind of laughing at myself. I don't know about you, but in my house, I clean the kitchen. I, you know, I, I worked my way through uh, high school and college cleaning, you know, working in kitchens, cooking and and yeah, I spent many nights cleaning the kitchen up. And I have in my, I live in a hundred year old house, so I still have an old gas range. I'm trying to up, update my electric panel right now so I can get a full induction range. But I have my old gas Wedgwood range, beautiful 1940s or 50s technology. And then I have a, a little induction tabletop hob. And I love using the little induction tabletop hob because I just wipe that guy off. And every week when I'm taking that Wedgwood apart and cleaning out all the crumbs and all the pieces, I'm thinking, man, I can't wait until I can just get the thing and wipe down. And then from the safety standpoint, like the thing that scares me the most in my house is my gas range because I've had people cook in it and not turn the oven off, you know, and that worries me, right, from, from carbon monoxide poisoning. And then, you know, once again, I don't know about you, but pretty much all the wooden spoons in my house have some burn marks on them where somebody pushed the spoon over too close to the flame. I'm really always worried that that open flame is gonna cause a fire in my old house, right? So that I think sometimes I think that the non-energy benefits are better than the energy benefits. But summarizing this little section, no flame means less fire and burn risk. Precise controls can reduce labor and food waste. Because once again, if I've got really precise controls on my, my cooktop, I'm not going to turn my back and actually burn something and have to scrape it out and throw it away, right? And then the easy cleaning really reduces labor. Once again, that, that big problem for all of commercial food service is labor right now. Finding somebody to work in our kitchens is a real challenge. 
OK, I did see a couple of questions. I want to just answer these really quick. And one is from Chef Chris. Hey, Chef Chris. And the question was, are there any conversations on gas and electric subsidies? And yes, Chris, at some point, the, the cost of electricity, the cost of gas, somehow we have to find a way to equalize those, right? Now, right now, the reason that electricity costs more, and this goes back to our last chapter, the reason electricity costs more than natural gas is that we take, you know, we, we tend to create electricity using natural gas in a big gas-fired turbine. So we put the gas in, we burn it, burn the gas, we turn the turbine, and then uh, we lose some energy in that conversion, and then we lose a bunch more energy as we push the electricity down the, the wires. And so we basically have a, you know, a, a manu electricity is, you can consider it in many ways, sort of like a manufactured product, and so it ends up costing more. But electric appliances are much more efficient, so it equalizes some. But at some point, you know, people are definitely talking about how do we overcome these, these cost differentials to try and make electricity more, more comparative to natural gas. It'll happen at some point. And then uh, there was another question, is electric equipment more expensive than gas equipment? That is an excellent question. And in almost every case, when we're talking about uh, traditional equipment, so fryers, griddles, convection ovens, combination ovens, the electric and gas appliances kind of cost about the same. Sometimes the electric appliance can be a little bit lower cost, right? So, and that's kind of by design. Manufacturers try to set it up so that they're they're kind of on parity. The one place where electric equipment costs a lot more than the gas equipment is induction cooktops. A gas range top, like I said, is just a simple 19th century piece of equipment that is just a chunk of metal with some valves. There's no real technology in there other than the design of the gas flow and the burner heads and all this kind of good stuff. But it's pretty simple. An induction cooktop, it's more like your smartphone. It has you know, power converters and safety mechanisms and controls and all of this kind of good stuff. So there's a lot of technology built into there. And yes, the induction cooktops do cost more uh, than the gas cooktop. But the cool thing is that the induction cooktop is so efficient that coming back to, to Chef Chris's question, the induction cooktop is so efficient that it doesn't really end up costing you any more than the gas range top because the gas range top is so low, low efficiency. So let's say gas range top is 25% efficient and the induction cooktop is 85% efficient. That, that difference kind of bridges that gap in fuel cost and equalizes them, right? So does that make sense? If it doesn't, we'll, we'll talk later about this. You can, you can contact me and I'll explain it further, but really great questions. And yes, somebody also mentions it looks like induction cooking is a lot safer, and that's true. And in a school kitchen, I think that's something to, to really be paying attention to. And I see a couple more questions. We'll come back to them. And Kiana has been publishing as we go, so that's great. Keep them coming. But I want to get back into like, you know, what's available in induction? What are the kind of things that you can have right now today that you could put in your school kitchen? Well, tabletop is one of the things that you can put into your kitchen right now today and already start to transition to induction cooking. And it's a great way to train people and get people interested in induction because once they play with that tabletop unit, then they're going to want the full size unit, right? The one thing I do want to tell you is there's multiple kinds of tabletop units. There are some tabletop units that run at 208 volts and they can have inputs of five kilowatts. That's really what you want in a commercial kitchen. There's some, oh, looks like I have uh, drawn, drawn a circle around the walk in a previous <laughs> version of this slide. It's, it's <laughs> so there are induction walks, there are induction griddles. I'm finding some programming in this slide that I put in in the past. The top row, we've got our traditional induction cooktops. The one on the far right would be a great example of one that's that runs like a commercial, full-size commercial range at 5 kW, right? The ones that are just the 120s that you plug in, you're not going to find those to be very satisfactory if you're really trying to do commercial uh, cooking. And I talked to the folks at San Francisco Unified School District where they did an all-electric kitchen, and they've got one of the little 120-volt plug-ins. And they're like, it's it's okay, but it's not really doing it. And that, and I said, yeah, there's a big difference between the one meant for your commercial kitchen and the other. Okay, and then my, my second line there where I had circled it, induction walks, tabletop walks, very cool, right? And you could do wok cooking in a, in a school kitchen right now today. These are very powerful walks. They work really, really well. And then down on the bottom left-hand corner, I had circled that little induction griddle. So you can put together a all electric induction kitchen, you know, on a kind of on a tabletop. And there are restaurants that do that right now. There's a really great breakfast restaurant down on College Avenue in uh, North Oakland. And you go in and they're doing all their cooking on some tabletop induction walks, right? All the production's right there. So it works. They're also drop-in units. These are very cool. If you want to, you know, kind of keep a clean countertop, 
you just drop these units in. You don't have to have something that's sitting up there and they've got woks and regular regular cooktops. I think these are pretty exciting. I know, you know, if you have a high production situation, then you you may need a stockpot range. And stockpot ranges are hot, you know, they're kind of heavy, they're kind of hard to clean. These induction uh, stockpot ranges are super powerful, easy to clean, and you know, really easy to install as well, right? So th this is a cool technology. And then there are the standalone ranges, which really kind of match up to traditional restaurant ranges. Mark is going to demo a couple of these, but I want to point out, you know, one like this can actually sit on top of refrigerated base. So that kind of makes things even better for you. I've got my range top and then I've got my refrigeration below. And then here's one that is a full on, whoops, I'm a terrible drawer with my right hand. Here's one that is a full on induction range, you know, with, with an oven in it and one that kind of acts like a French top. It's a very high tech piece of equipment and super versatile. And then we also have in our facility a full size walk range. So the induction walk range. So those do exist and, and, and they work really well. They're super powerful. And then the other thing to think about beyond just the cooking is induction warming and holding because in a school, you're doing a lot of prep cooking and then setting things out sort of cafeteria style and you're, and you're dishing it out. And induction uh, warming and holding works really, really well. It works much better. It saves energy and it gives you much better food quality than your traditional resistance electric holding equipment. And that includes, you know, the wells and soup wells and all kind of cool stuff. So, so talk to us about this. This one right here, this is a sort of hidden chafing dish induction system that I see popping up in hotels all over the place. They, they work beautifully. Really great, consistent food holding temperatures. You don't tend to burn food up. In fact, one of the cool things about these induction soup warmers, besides the fact that they're, they're really low cost, is that the soup warmer has a, a level sensor in it. And so as the level of the soup is going down, it's actually modifying the temperature, it's dropping the temperature. So you still have safe temperatures for the soup, but you don't end up, I'm sorry, it's not the temperature, it's the energy. So you still have you know, safe temperature for the soup, but you don't end up burning that last quarter down at the bottom of the container. A traditional resistance you know, soup warmer, it's just an element in there, it's dumb, it doesn't know what's up and you end up you know, burning stuff and scraping it out, right? So labor savings, food savings, and you cut your energy use by over 50%. Little tabletop piece of equipment, cut your energy use in half. You know, that's awesome, right? That's, I, I like to tell people like, that's the Green New Deal right there. People griping about the Green New Deal. No, this is it. It's a piece of equipment that works better and cuts my bill in half. That's what I want. So let's take a quick, uh, Quick discussion. Oh, you know what? Let me go back. I'm going to answer a couple questions here real quick. How durable is induction cooktop compared to traditional range? What are comparative maintenance costs? I think this is a great question, and I don't know that we can completely answer this. You know, I like to answer this question on the on the gas range side with, with kind of a funny but true statement. You know, somebody asked me, how long will a gas range top last? And I go like a thousand years, okay? Because it's just a hunk of freaking metal. <laughs> and you can screw in a couple of new valves. So it lasts forever. But, you know, back when I was a kid, we had one of those black rotary phones in my house. It's plugged into the wall. Yeah, that'll last a thousand years too. But I guarantee you, I don't have one now. I have a smartphone, you know? So that, so it's kind of apples and oranges when we talk about this. The the commercial induction ranges are meant to be tough. They're, they're built to last. They have a very hard ceramic top to protect the electronics. But yes, I guarantee you if somebody came in there with a hose and blasted the back of it, you know, and all the electronics, yeah, you might be able to destroy it pretty quickly. Or if you don't give it any air, that's going to damage it. And there will be components that fail. But once again, it's just like my cell phone. You know, I get a new cell phone every so many years. It's sort of built into my my economics, you know, my home my home ec now is I'm going to replace this piece of equipment. And like I say, those those traditional dial up phones, they just they last forever. I think I got two of them in the basement. I don't have any place to plug them in. So if somebody needs a dial up phone, let me know. So great question. Let's see. What's the life cycle of conduction cooktop appliances? Electronics typically do not like heat compared to. Yeah, I mean, this is same, kind of the same um, same question. I think you meant induction. And, and like I said, we don't totally know, but I can tell you that this is not a brand new technology either. We've been studying induction cooking in our facility in San Ramon for, I know, at least 25 years. I started uh, testing induction walks and range tops 25 years ago. 
They use these in Europe. They use them in Asia, extensively in Asia. I mean, there's a track record of, you know, technology and toughness there. So I'm not expecting you to put these things in and have them die immediately. Let's see. Does the quality of the cookware affect the efficiency of the induction system? This is a great question. And yes, the quality of the cookware can affect the induction system. The cool thing is that the better induction cooktops now have more advanced electronics and they can better match the electromagnetic field to the cookware. So, but yeah, we have tested in the past and you can see some difference. It's not a radical difference, but yes, if you're, you know, like the best thing to do would be to get the induction ready cookware that's got the logo on it. Let's see, you mentioned upgrading your electrical panel. What grades are required for residential applications? Yeah, well, I, like I say, I live in a hundred year old house. And uh, when we moved in, you know, 25 years ago, I still had fuses. They were put in in like 1918. And uh, so we upgraded the panel once with the, you know, with the existing weatherhead there. And my, so my house has like 90 amps. And in a residential situation, you know, your, a regular full-size residential induction range is going to run about 50 amps. So I need bigger breakers. Plus, I want to get an electric vehicle. So I'm upgrading my panel to, you know, a couple hundred amps. But it's, it takes a little work. And in a hundred-year-old house, I have some knob and tube wiring. So... Once again, this is a whole nother class, but it's it's a great question. It's not something that you just can flip on a dime. And similarly, in your commercial kitchen, you have to go look at your panel, see if you have any space, what's been used. So in a retrofit situation, going all electric takes a little more thinking and brain power, and it could take some expensive electrical upgrades in new construction. Of course, you just build it right in. It's not a problem. Let's see, do you know the vendors who are selling induction capable cookware for school kitchens? There, there would be no special, you know, induction ready for school kitchen. It would just be induction ready. Anything that's gonna work in a traditional commercial kitchen will work for you. And there are plenty of vendors out there. All the major vendors are selling induction ready. And like I, like I said, you know, a regular cast iron pot will work as well. And, and Mark will show you a little bit of this. Is fire suppression same for all electric kitchens? And the fire suppression is really built around the fuel that's the fuel and the temperature typically of the piece of equipment. So a let's take let's take an example, probably the most dangerous thing that could be in a commercial kitchen, which is typically not going to be in any school kitchens, is a fryer. And so the Ansel system will be set up for a fryer and for an oil fire, right? That's what, the, that's what you really care about. And whether it's a gas fryer or electric fryer, the Ansel would be the same. So yeah, you're, you, you can probably, if you go all electric and you downsize your hoods and you downsize your, your CFM and reduce your, you know, like if you're, if you're using more ovens than say broilers, anything that might be an open flame, an oven's going to need a, it's going to require a, a simpler Ansel and a smaller Ansel system. So yeah, there, there could be some savings there. That's a really good question. And I'm glad you asked that. Let's see what infrastructure upgrades can school districts anticipate to upgrade kitchens to all electric. And once again, it's probably going to be more than anything. It's your electric panel. You know, it's do you have enough incoming amperage to cover any appliances that you're adding? Kind of one benefit, though, it, one, one thing is that kitchens tend to be in a, you know, in a school or in a bigger building. And, uh, you know, in some of those buildings, if it's a little older school, pr have pretty big panels because you, you know, you had a panel that was going to power all of those old lighting systems. If you've done a lighting retrofit, you've gone to LEDs, you've probably reduced your electric needs in the building you may find that you've got some panel space because you've reduced that, right? More efficient air conditioning and, and lighting upgrades may give you some space to upgrade your, your kitchen. But that's the one big challenge is your electric panel. Let's see, is there any initiative for renewable energy for schools? This is sort of a big picture question. This is one that uh, Ida can answer. I know that lots of schools have done renewable energy. They've used various bond credits. I know I've, I've test, I, I've, I've co-taught out at, co -taught out at uh, Mount Diablo High School and they have their, their own, you know, PV system out there. So yes, and, and it's, it's kind of a cool and related question because if you have a PV system, you now become the utility, you're now generating electricity. It makes sense for you to use that electricity on your site first before you, you know, say sell it back to the utility. So they do tie together. Let's see, do you minimize or remove kitchen hoods or other fire department requirements, Ansel systems, et cetera? You know, let's just, let's move into this next chapter here and induction cook, 
uh, kitchen comfort, and I think that'll help answer it. You can't you can't remove everything. Fire is fire. If I'm creating grease, I have to have an Ansel system. If I'm creating grease, I have to have a hood system and filters and all this kind of stuff. But we may be able to downsize a little bit. And one of the cool things is maybe we can increase the comfort. So here I've got you know a couple of our technicians in the lab. They're cooking some burgers. And this is a little uh, science lesson in heat, right? There's really three kinds of heat transfer. There's the conduction, which is happening because those burgers are touching that hot grating, okay? So that's heat transfer from conduction. There's convection, which is, is like all the heat that tends to go up and gets captured by the exhaust hood. And that's what exhaust hoods are great at, you know? It's a uh, fire suppression and it's also, you know, comfort and it's, and it's safety because we're pulling that smoke out. But there's a third kind of heat, and that is radiant heat. And you can actually see that reflected in Wes's head there, right? And radiant heat is the thing that makes us all miserable in the kitchen, makes it hot, makes it uncomfortable, and slows down our workers and just generally makes everybody unhappy, right? So radiation, if we can cut that radiation down, that can make a kitchen better. Well, we did some testing in our facility in San Ramon. And let's just look here at the, let's see. I will pull this up on this axis. I have radiant heat gain to the space. OK, and that's in BTUs per hour and about, you know, 12,000 BTU per hour is a ton of air conditioning. So this kind of puts it into perspective. And down here on the bottom, we have several scenarios and the blue lines are the gas ranges. And then gray, if there was any gray, would be the induction range top, okay? So in my first situation, I have six pots of water on a range top. They're all boiling, which could be, you know, say I'm doing pasta. It's pasta day at the school. I got six pots of water on a gas range top, and I'm generating about almost 8,000 BTU per hour of radiant heat into the space. And guess what? I'm doing the same job with an induction cooktop, and I have zero radiant heat, right? If I if I cut that in half, three that you know, three pots, it cuts the heat in half, still zero for the induction. Let's say I'm just I just turn on all the burners, I'm going to do, you know, saute or whatever. I'm about to put pots on there. Just an idle condition with my gas range top. That's a ton of air conditioning, right? Radiating into the the face of the cook and also driving the thermostat, but zero because when, if, if I don't have anything on the cooktop, the induction cooktop doesn't draw any energy. It's essentially off until I put a pot on it, right? So zero and same thing for, you know, half. So, so what I'm telling you here is compared to a gas range, the induction range top is radiating, you know, zero heat out into the space and into the face of the, of the cooks. That's not that way for all, all, all pieces of electric equipment. An electric fryer radiates about the same amount of heat as a gas fryer. An electric convection oven radiates about the same amount of heat as a gas convection oven, okay? But for the induction cooktops, which is, you know, the, there's the, you know, working over the hot stove notion, that's the image we all have, there would be, you know, no radiant heat coming off of that. So at least coming out, right? So very cool stuff. And then when it comes down to the, the sort of the second question is, you know, how much air do I have to move through there? So in this slide, I have what we call the capturing containment rate for, the, for a piece of equipment or a process. And that's measured in cubic feet per minute, CFM. And once again, the, the blue is the gas, the gray is the induction range top, top. And so in my first situation here, I've got, I'm boiling six pots. Once again, it's pasta day. I need 2000, you know, it's like 2100 cubic feet per minute of ventilation for the gas range top. And I need about 1200 for the induction range top. And if I put side panels on, which is something every designer should be doing in all hoods, that's what SP stands for. You can see that number drops a little bit. So side panels help you to reduce your, uh, your exhaust needs in a kitchen. So th this is energy savings, it's noise reduction, all kind of good stuff. If you carry it across in pretty much every situation, the gas range top requires about a thousand CFM more than the induction range top. So yes, we can get some savings on our mechanical loads there on our on our capture and our, our CFM, our ventilation rates by going to the induction range top. Very cool stuff, right? And if we go to the all electric kitchen and we start using more pieces of equipment like uh, combination ovens, then we can reduce even more because the, the the cubic feet per minute is really related to what kind of piece of equipment you have under it. If something has a big flame and a lot of you know smoke coming off of it, a broiler needs a lot of cubic feet of air to, to capture that. A combination oven needs very little, right? It's already easy to capture. So 
Getting back, we can say induction cooking performs better. Induction is a disruptive technology, right? So, and, and I've got a, here's another thing I just want to clear up. There's a slight misperception that creating all electric kitchens requires an all induction kitchen. I keep hearing people say, oh, I want to go to uh, all, all induction. I need an all induction or I need an induction oven. There's no such thing as an induction oven. Somebody tried to make an induction fryer, but it didn't really, it didn't really make any sense. It didn't really work that well, right? So induction is just one way of transferring heat and it happens to work well for range tops and walks and for holding. But for all these other pieces of equipment, you know, broilers, fryers, pasta cookers, ovens, you know, steamers and kettles, the, the regular heat transfer, just resistance elements inside those work just fine. They don't, they don't need to be induction. In fact, it makes no sense to have an induction version of that. So just kind of a nomenclature thing there. Let me go back to questions real quick. Let's see, if electricity is a produced commodity and we increase the demand, what is the carbon difference between using a gas range and the increased demand for electricity? Great question. The whole, all of this electrification pivots on the fact that we are moving towards completely decarbonized electricity, clean electricity. So if our electricity completely comes from you know, renewable sources, hydro sources, nuclear is still in California, but it's going away. But if we have completely decarbonized electricity, then we can run that induction cooktop completely decarbonized. That's what we're shooting for. Now, if we were down in, and, and California in general has a very good, already very clean electricity mix. So if I'm running my, um, if I'm running my electric kitchen in California, I have a much lower carbon footprint than if I was running a, a gas kitchen, okay? And in, in some places, like where I live here in Oakland, I can buy completely clean electricity. So my, like my house is zero, my computer, everything is zero carbon right now. All my electricity is coming from renewables. But if I was down, say, in the southeast, where they still have coal plants and they have a fairly dirty mix, then going all electric right now today could create more carbon. I mean, that's that's an important aspect of this. And what we know is that those utilities are trying to catch up. They all have mandates for clean electricity. But it's a really great question. And I appreciate that. What kind of power supply is required for induction equipment? I mean, it's it's basically it's going to be you know 208 volt plug into the wall. Uh, you don't have an, you don't need a special power supply. The power supply is built into the piece of equipment. You're just going to hook it up like any other an, an oven or a fryer or anything else that you're going to plug into your system. Hook up to. Let's see. I have an induction cooktop at home. Been a big fan. Always been curious about the strength and resiliency of the glass top. How is it? <laughs> how is it to break or crack? It's actually pretty hard. You know, there's the, the test is you drop a uh, bowling ball from a meter. It's a very tough substance. You know, the, that ceramic glass. Will there be somebody who? finds a way to break it, yeah, because we're humans. We can break any freaking thing you put in front of us. But it's not like those things are easy to break. You you know, there's a great video of, of somebody dropping a bowling ball and it's bouncing on the surface and they keep taking it up higher and higher. So they're meant to be tough. Should an induction range be installed under hood? And yes, if you are, you know, anytime you're cooking and creating any grease that has to be under hood, okay? That's fire protection. If I'm cooking bacon, off on the side, you know, not under a hood, that grease is gonna to stick to the wall, stick to the ceiling, I've created a fire hazard. So it has less to do about the kind of range top and much more to do about uh, the cooking process. But if I'm over on the other side of the room and I'm just keeping some soup warm on an induction cooktop, there's no, I'm not creating any grease, that one does not necessarily need to be under hood. Your typical, you know, if you're doing a new kitchen design, just plan on putting your induction a cooktop under hood as part of your line. That's gonna that's gonna make it the best. But if you need to, you know, do an omelet station someplace, you know, do a little temporary thing, you can do that. And it's kind of one of the beauty of beauties of having the little portable units you can plug in. You can do some some low intensity cooking without without having exhaust hood. Oh, let's see, coupling with Chef Galarz's question, what are the requirements for when a public school needs to convert to electric? Oh, this is a really great question. You know, is it just when there's a permitted alteration or reconstruction and are there any grants or incentives for converting that districts can apply for? You know, I, I wanna say there may be 40 different municipalities in California now that have electric reach codes that apply to new construction. So far, everything has been new construction. Now, will the California Energy Commission change and say, you know, statewide, everything has to go all electric new construction. I don't know yet, but I know in various municipalities, you build a new school, 
you're going to need to do an all electric kitchen. It's going to be all electric construction. This is still in the policy side. It's still changing. I do not know of any grants that have been given out to school districts to either convert to all electric. But once again, that's a great question for Ida because she's got a better feel for that than I do. But it's a really great question. And I know, and, and, and coming back to that question real quickly, I can say that in the past there have been grants for school districts to purchase more efficient equipment. And much to our frustration, those grants quite often never were used because folks in the school districts did not know how to purchase the more efficient equipment or how to use those funds. If that ever comes around again, please contact us. If somebody contacts your school and says, we've got money for you to go all electric, contact us. We will come help you figure out how to design and spend that money to your, your best advantage and get you the kitchen you want. Uh, let's see, what would you expect the average total electrical load to be for a total electric kitchen? This could be all over the place. And in this next little section, you'll see why. So that one's a hard one to answer, right? So it really depends, but we can help you figure what that load is. If you come in and say, I got this middle school and here's the meals and here's the pieces of equipment, we know how to model that out and tell you the energy use and the demand, right? The expected demand. Let's see, vendors selling induction. So we already talked about the, the vendors. Most of the major vendors have induction ready cook pots. And yes, those, those cheap aluminum pots, those will have to go, right? And Mark will talk a little bit about, when he does his demo, he talks about why you don't want those things anyway. They carbonize, they're kind of disposable. Uh, let's see, are there any studies done in schools surrounding electrification and PM 2.5? This is a great question. The I tend to be very careful about the air quality issues with induction. I've read those studies. My personal opinion is that we are making some connections that might be a little tenuous there. The engineer in me says to be, you know, very careful. I would suggest that you go out and read those studies as well. It's boring and you got to dig like levels and levels and spend hours to get down to the real data. But, you know, it's, it's worth doing so. And there's two ways of looking at that. There's the residential side, like my house, which has crappy, you know, ventilation as all homes do. And there's so there's the, you know, the, the nitrous oxides, the PM 2.5, all this stuff that comes off in my house. And then there is commercial kitchens. There's induction co cooking commercial kitchens where we have very good ventilation. OK, so in my house, that's where there's potential for, you know, asthma issues with nitrous oxides and all this kind of stuff, because we are breathing all that particulate. In a commercial kitchen, it's really not an issue because you're capturing all of that with the exhaust to it. So the air quality issues in commercial kitchens, not really a thing, right? Because we're not we're not that's that, that effluent is not hanging around in the space. So, but a great question. And talk about indirect cost savings, such as, you know, water infrastructure. Yeah, this is all great. If you're, we were talking about this recently in one of our kitchen electrification groups, you know, if you were doing wok cooking with a traditional wok, yeah, huge amounts of water can go down the drain versus the induction wok. I don't know if any school districts have woks yet. I, I kind of think it would be cool, particularly as you go to cooking meals for everybody, healthy meals, fast to cook, great food quality. I could see that scratch cooking. I could see all those things working. As we move to our all electric kitchen, yeah, you can, you know, create some benefits, infrastructure benefits by reducing the exhaust hoods, reducing the size of the kitchen, using combi ovens and using them properly and programming them. That can cut your wall. Let's see. Can you explain why the idle load is higher than the boiling load? Oh, remember those were two completely different slides. Okay, or right, let's actually, let's just go back real quick. Let's make sure I'm not missing something. Oh yes, I right, see what you're saying. Why is the, let's see if we can erase everything. You're basically saying, here's the boiling. The radiant heat that comes off of boiling is this. The radiant heat that comes off of idling is that. And that's because when I'm boiling, I have pots. Okay, I have pots over the flame. And so those are blocking some of the radiant heat. When I'm not, when I'm just idling, I have no pots. I'm just getting all of the heat. So yeah, great question. Thank you for that. And let's see, we did this one and let's see if there's another. You guys are great. You're asking lots of great questions. Are the containment air volumes based on control system automatically adjusting our design air volumes? <clears throat> and in this situation, so that goes back to this slide here. These are our capture and containment. This is essentially what we did in our facility because we have this, we have the ability to, to do heat gain testing, and hood testing, capture and containment testing in our facility in San Ramon. So in this case, we brought the pieces of equipment in. We we physically put, you know, say, let's say this first one here. We physically put, you know, six pots on the piece of equipment with boiling water. And then we have a visualization device that allows us to see whether the exhaust hood is capturing the, the affluent, the heat and the steam that's coming off. 
and we adjust that, we adjust the exhaust hood rate, which is basically what you're asking. We adjust the exhaust hood rate until we get to a capturing containment level. So we had to adjust this exhaust hood up to about 2100 CFM to capture and contain the same amount of heat and steam that, that we could do with this one at 2100, right? We put the induction under there, then we adjust the exhaust hood. Wow, we can turn it down to 2100. So, you know, a direct answer to that is that this is all lab-based testing that we really did. Now, let's see, how does an induction griddle work? Doesn't the entire griddle plate heat up like a pan? Essentially, yes. And that's why you typically see, you know, the induction griddles that are out there tend to be smaller. A, a regular old resistance griddle that's high efficiency will work fine. In fact, the AccuTemp griddles are the best. They they have this sort of air pocket inside them. They're, they're super efficient and they're, they're not induction. But the little tabletop induction ones are cool and they and they work fairly well, right? So, and oh, somebody asked me the ultimate question, what is scratch cooking? So, you know, when I was a kid, you know, way back when I rode a dinosaur to school, I went to the my elementary school and got into the line and they served me out mac and cheese and spinach and, you know, fried chicken or whatever that actual humans cooked in food service equipment, you know, in a kitchen. And then over time, we sort of evolved our, our school food service to be more of a commodities-based thing where we get frozen pizza and we re-therm it, you know, we get some frozen chicken nuggets and we re-therm it. So a lot of school kitchens have gone to this kind of, you know, the kind of government cheese model, which is I'm getting some I'm getting some commodities and all I have to do is stick it in a re-therm cabinet and then serve it out. That's not terribly healthy. It's not terribly tasty. You know, my kids did not tend to eat the school food because it was not healthy and not tasty. Scratch cooking is coming back to, you know, my glorious childhood where real humans actually take, you know, produce, vegetables, meats, and cook them, you know, fresh in the kitchen and serve them. And it just ups the quality of food tremendously and it, up, it ups the, you know, the consumption of food on site. So you guys have been great. You're asking, oh, what are the disadvantages of going all electric? I can't really see any disadvantages to tell you the truth. It really makes huge sense for school kitchens to go all electric. So you've been great. You've asked a lot of questions. I'm going to burn through another little section here and then we're going to turn it over to Mark. And uh, yeah, you're really good students today, so thanks. And like I said, we, if we need to, we'll go all the way to noon. So chapter three, transforming that kitchen, right? And we kind of touched on some of this stuff. If we look at your kitchen now, you've got all of these, you know, essentially traditional pieces of equipment that could be in your kitchen, your rotisserie or, you know, convection ovens, ranges, stockpot range, fryers, all this kind of stuff above the line. And then below the line, we have all of these cool things that can actually replace a lot of these processes. So, you know, the game is to, let's see, let's see if I can get my pointer. The game is I've got, you know, a, I got a convection oven up here, you know, so what pieces of equipment do I replace that with? Well, maybe I, I use a combi oven, maybe a blast chiller, maybe a mini combi, maybe a half size rack oven. Maybe, you know, a high speed oven. There's all these various combinations of things that now we can put together to, you know, and maybe maybe I throw in some other cooking techniques like, you know, recirculators or sous vide, right? So there, so it's a mixture of choosing new equipment, replacing traditional equipment, choosing new equipment, and also thinking about new techniques, right? So it's a, it's a brave new world. And that's one of the things that we can help you with. And you, you kind of look at your menu and, and See all this kind of cool stuff. Mark is going to show you one of one of the coolest ones, with, which is this sort of multi-purpose braising pan. So he'll he'll show you a version of that. So first off, like I say, is just replace that. You know, one of the biggest things you can do is replace your convection ovens with combination ovens, or at least augment them. Right. Here's a study that that we did down in San Diego. On the left is my convection oven, and and you can see that this is the energy use. All of the red lines are the energy use. Everything underneath those is is you you know something I had to pay for. Uh, and this side, and in this case, these were both gas pieces of equipment. Here's the combination of it in blue, and you can see that I'm using a lot less energy and ended up saving 650 bucks a year and also increased our um, menu capabilities, right? So combi ovens save you energy and kind of turn your kitchen into a Swiss army knife. They're really the way to go. So, so, so Mark and I did this kind of fun thing. We took some photos of kitchens, of school kitchens that had been collected on our site surveys over the years. And, you know, so I got a couple of convection ovens and kind of a, a holding cabinet here, maybe a cook and hold. What can I replace that with? Well, maybe I put a combination oven on top, keep my convection on bottom, and maybe a steam jacketed kettle. 
you know, that that gives me more production. I can do some scratch cooking out of that. And it's still in a very small space because this is a very, this is like a rolling kitchen here, you know, very small space. Another one, we had some steamers. We had a couple of convection ovens. Hey, about uh, replacing that with a combination oven, keep the convection oven, a couple of holding cabinets, because now I can do all my steaming in the combination oven. You know, there's mixtures. Here's another one. I got a couple of convections, a little, a little small range, couple of holding cabinets or cook and hold. You know, same thing. Add, add a combi oven, add an induction cooktop, give me a little bit more production space, give me some holding space. I can do everything in the same space. It's all electric and it's super efficient and much more flexible. This is a bigger school kitchen. I took our, our site survey guy, Todd, took a picture of. You can see they've already got some rational combis in there, which is great. They got multiple convections, but they had that great big range battery. If they if they remove that the range battery and put in some induction cooktops, they, they could have an all electric kitchen. Super simple. That's why I say I think this is something very doable for schools. And here is I, I went I was t totally, you know, and I don't know if Nick is on the line today, but Nick from San Francisco Unified School District invited me to come over and see their, their all-electric kitchen. It's They do both central cook, cooking out of here and also cooking for students. And they did some cool things. They still have some convection ovens. I'm a terrible drawer. They have a sort of cook and hold down here at the end, but they have a, a big, one of the bigger style combination ovens. And they can do a massive amount of production out of this combination oven. This is the one that that's driving it, right? This is the thing that makes this kitchen possible. And what Nick told me was, I see you see all the students lined up down here. He told me they used to, you know, run this kitchen and they get, yeah, you know, a few students would take the lunch, probably the ones that really needed it. And once they started uh, doing some scratch cooking and up, up their food quality using these new pieces of equipment, now all the students want to eat lunch there and all the faculty, right? So this kitchen is now turned into a revenue side for them and people are totally happy. They also have some steam jacketed kettles for the bigger production stuff. They have demand control kitchen ventilation, which is, a, which is really important. That's something you want to put into your facilities. And then they're using a blast chiller as well. So they're using this mixture of sort of cook chill technologies, combi technologies, cook and hold, retherm, you know, just doing it really well and it's and it's all electric, right? So really cool kitchens. And there's one thing, so we've been talking a lot about equipment, uh, a couple of other things to consider. And once again, this is other presentations, we can't cover it today, but if you wanna go all electric, you really have to look at your hot water system. So if I've got, you know, MEP people on here, architects listening, you need to talk to us about how to do the hot water systems. If you're going to need the heat pump water heaters, you can't use those in a traditional way in a commercial kitchen. So, and heat, heat recovery dish machines is another thing. And you're going to need some dish machines because you're going to start to see more reusable ordinances statewide. Just go ahead and plan for that. You, you're going to need plates and silverware. You can't just continue to throw stuff away, all your, all your servingware like we've been doing. And then kitchen ventilation is the other thing, right? If we go all electric, we can modify that kitchen ventilation. So talk to us about all that stuff. We've answered most of our questions. Let's see, potential disadvantage, isn't gas more reliable, especially with current environment and fires and power outages? You know, this is an argument that folks make. I just want to point out that it is the law that if you, if you do not have an exhaust hood, you cannot cook. So if you're in a place and there is a electrical outage, your exhaust hoods cannot run. You are not supposed to turn on any of your equipment. Even if you've got a gas oven, you're not supposed to turn it on, okay? And then also awful lot of uh, modern pieces of gas equipment also now have electronic components in it. So and it's kind of a, it's kind of a legit, argument, legit argument, but it's not really. Um, by law, you're not supposed to operate that equipment. How important is it to have a chef involved in projects to provide proper training and guidance to staff? And I think having a chef is great. And this is really good point, uh, Chris, because what we find is that particularly with combination ovens, people will buy the ovens and then never use them as, as they're meant to be. I mean, you've got this really great, incredible tool that can do everything under the sun and people will just plug them in and use them like a convection oven. So chef training does make a lot of sense. And let's see, do we have DSA? And I can't answer the question on the DSA inspection and approval to turn kitchens all electric. I'm going to have to I'll toss that one back over to Ida and the DSA folks. Sweet, but great questions. So now we're going to do a Q&A with Chef Mark. And but what I'd like to do, because boy, we've been rocking and rolling here for like an hour and 15 minutes. You guys have been great. So we're going to take a five minute break. And I'm going to play the song Take Five by Dave Brubeck. All right, everybody, welcome back from our break. I am now going to 
stop sharing my slides and we will go over to Chef Mark in the lab. Chef Mark will do some demos for you and then at the very end, we'll leave some time to come back because the last thing I will share is all of the resources that you can tap into to make your electric kitchens happen. And I do want to ask, answer one more question. Actually, it's a two-part question. It says, may we have the link to this video? And as we mentioned earlier, it will go up on the DSA learning management system, and there's going to be a recording of it. And we will also post it on the same learning management system that you use to log in today. So you'll be able to get it both places. We did put the handouts into the, the question box so you can grab the handouts. And the, other, the second part of that question is, we give Ida time to answer questions at the end of the webinar. And we do have at the at the total end, oh, thank you for the choice of music. At the total end of the webinar, I do have one final spot we can answer some questions. So stick with us till the end. And if that's good with Ida, we'll, we'll do a, a Q and A at the very tail end here. But let's click over, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing. And now we should be able to see Chef Mark come up. There we go, excellent. Over to you, Chef Mark. Hey everybody, you can hear me okay? Just to confirm, we're good, yeah. thumbs up. All right, great. So yeah, we wanna get started here first by I think looking at some of those technologies that Richard had referred to in the beginning because it's important to note that there's also some, some opportunities here when we're looking to rebuild uh, or redesign these kitchens. For so long, we have been using that very traditional, very manual model. And as we move forward here, there's some great opportunities to be able to re-examine those processes. I think somebody had asked if it would be wise to have a chef involved in the, in the, in, in the process. And I would say it doesn't necessarily have to be a chef, quote unquote, but it should, it should certainly be somebody who's qualified or, or who has experience in, in managing food, food operations. And I think that because, you know, this is a holistic approach and the devil is in the details. So. The more you can have somebody in there who's um, experienced with running those operations and, those, and is familiar with the processes, that will help to you know combine these things together. You know, in the spirit of you know making the kitchen, of course, more efficient. But to be more efficient means that we want to explore all of these areas because they all matter, right? We want to make the the you know the ergonomics. They they all factor in. So the first thing I want to touch on is because these will probably be some of the biggest pieces you're going to be encountering that will make the biggest difference in the very beginning as far as production go would be uh, the combination oven which Richard had talked about so I'm going to come over here and you should see our combination oven here now there's a, there's a, quite a few manufacturers out there this just happens to be the one we have out right now one of the largest manufacturers being rationale there's some others like combo therm and and others and we can that's definitely something we can help one of the things we find that's very very important when it comes to choosing things like this is actually interface so when it comes to you know what what the operator is most comfortable with it is nice to be able to come and interface with that you know kind of going back to some of that analogy that richard was talking about with smartphones or even computers or anything like that or even sometimes cars right now as we have more interface with that it's whatever feels most comfortable to those to those operators and really the key there is that your chances for adoption are just that much better you also it is pretty, it's suggested that you would, you know, if, if a manufacturer has, and they've been working on this over the past couple of years, the platform is the same on, across all of their pieces of equipment. That obviously makes it training and, and interaction much easier as well. So this is a combination oven here, and it's a little bit different than our, you know, standard convection oven in the sense that uh, most convection ovens are just kind of a hot box that blows around hot air. And there's this misconception out there that convection ovens, by the fact that they blow around air, that they are more even at heating. I and mean, that can be as true as it is untrue, right? So one of the issues there is if the fan is just perpetually blowing in one direction, you're going to have typically, it could be really good at heating very specific spots in the oven, and that's about it. The reason convection ovens, <coughs> pardon me, work a little bit better than conventional ovens, uh, ovens without fans, is that you're actually disrupting that airflow. So that allows that heat energy to um, make it to the food or that thermal mass that's inside the oven and allows it to penetrate. Now there is something to the evenness um, in an oven, something uh, like this. Typically what they'll have is they'll actually have a large fan on the side or in the back. And that oversized fan actually counter rotates. So because the fan spins in one direction, typically what you'll have is two hot sides and two cold sides. So what they'll do is they'll actually stop it and then spin it back the other way. And that really helps to even everything out. What makes the oven, uh, these ovens really good at, at even heating is actually if you'll notice on the inside, the inside is shiny, right? It's not dark like you'd picture most ovens being. Most of us don't pay attention to that, but now that you've noticed it, that is a big deal. 
So because it's shiny inside, you have this reflective surface, and that's what allows that heat energy to bounce around inside the cavity until it finds its, its home in, in the food that you're cooking. So in that sense, if it's more uh, efficient at you know, bouncing around inside there and creating more heat, even heating, that also means that you're, you're going to speed up your cook times as well. Now, because combination ovens are a combination of that convection oven like we just talked about, it also can be a steamer. So what comes along with being a steamer? Well, that means that the cavity itself needs to be insulated. So these cavities are insulated. Rather than using metal flanges, these use rubber gaskets. These rubber gaskets are easy to swap out for the most part. Most manufacturers make it pretty easy, but that is something you'd wanna take into account when you have like a preventative maintenance plan. They have triple pane glass windows. And what does that mean? Well, that means that, you know, the more energy that we can keep inside the box, that means the less energy we have to generate to just kind of keep that going. So steam is actually a dry heat, so it's clear. It's not white plumes, that's condensate, right? That's steam or water vapor returning back to whatever the ambient temperature is. So steam actually being a dry heat though means that it will eventually dry something out, even if you leave it in a steamer. But what you're doing is you're able to cook at higher temperatures without browning. So when you're doing something like that, that means that you can actually control humidity if you're in combi mode. So let's say you're going to roast something. Well, as we all know, cooking is kind of a distance rate and time problem. And you can adjust those things to arrive at your destination later or sooner. And in this case, what we can do is if we can adjust moisture in the cavity, that means that we can have less browning and cook at a slightly higher temperature to be able to get those things done. Now within that, um, you'll see over here, sometimes it's hard to see the screens and we invite, that's why we invite people to come in and check it out. Typically on the screen, you'll see steam, combination and convection. So in a manual mode, you can choose any of those items and you can uh, choose different controls within that. But you also have built pre-built recipes. Most of the manufacturers have been really, really good about pre-building these recipes into the units. And the reason for that is because starting from zero with ovens like this is really a challenge, right? That's really hard to just come from zero and be able to like build all these recipes that you want. So you can take the recipes that they make and then modify them and make them your own. And those recipes can be staged. So that's important to say like, you know, if you, if you do want to roast, you know, you can start out at one stage, let's say in a really moist environment, because you want to start cooking that temperature or, or getting the center to a certain temperature. Now, as you're getting closer to the end of that, you, let's say you want more color on the outside. If the oven itself will go into another stage, it'll start pulling that moisture out and increasing uh, your convective heat temperatures, and you'll you're able to get to that temperature. Another really, really um, critical piece to most combination ovens nowadays is that they have feedback. So they have this probe inside of them. And what that probe allows you to do is if you're setting a recipe or you can do this in manual mode, you can either choose to cook by time or you can cook by temperature. So you take the probe, you'd stick it inside the piece of meat. These actually use an average temperature. So as you notice here, like a cook comes along and sticks this inside of a pork chop, all of a sudden this end is no good. The, they're actually smart enough to figure out like what that average temperature should so you're not dealing with that issue. And you can cook by temperature. So it'll say, you know, as the internal temperature reaches a certain point, I know to go to the next stage of the recipe and then keep moving and keep going. When it's done with that process, the oven will actually, you can choose to have it shut down. So it's not continuing to cook and you don't potentially lose all that product. It also means that the cooks don't have to constantly monitor the, uh, the unit. It can do its own thing. And then it won't, you know, your, your chances of losing product or, or, or controlling product quality is, is much better. You do also have HACCP, which is important too. So it's logging. If you're using recipes, it'll actually log those processes. So if they're, you know, needing to control these processes, let's say it's a commissary kitchen that's feed, you know, it's a, like a hub and spoke model. You can actually, those, those require, I'm sure, you know, because you're, because your exposure rate is higher, you start to have to have HACCP plans in place. These will auto log a lot of that stuff. And then the other part that's the favorite of all cooks is that they're self-cleaning. It's actually bad to manually clean these ovens because you etch that reflective surface. So what you do is you, for the most part, you just put chemicals inside or some of them already have them built in, in, in like liquid jugs form. You hit clean and the oven can clean itself overnight or during off times. You can do intermittent cleanings too because they will get dirty depending on what you're doing. But it's a really a great labor saver. And really what you're doing is, you know, when we think about all of these things, keep in mind that really what you're doing is you're, just like in anything, we're automating, right? We're passing off repetitive processes onto machines that are quite honestly better at doing repetitive processes than we are. So we start with the combi. We're gonna move over here. This is uh, another piece that Richard was talking about. It's a little bit unique. And this is called, this particular one is called an Ivario, but really what it is, is it's an automated braising pan. There's a few manufacturers that make them. And this is actually the only other thing that Rationale makes and that, so they make combis and then they make this guy here. So what's interesting about these is 
we talked about other solutions besides induction, and this would be potentially one of those other solutions. So if we're doing a lot of like, you know, reheating or making, well, you can make rice and things like that, but if you're making beans or let's say you are making stocks or you're making soups, you know, you're cooking pastas, you're doing things like that. A lot of those things can be done in combis, but it might not always be the most expedient way to do that work, right? I mean, you can certainly, you know, do a lot of that work in here, but you can also do a lot of that work in here. So what's nice about using these is say, rather than using a, a manual process of induction unit, you pass that work into something like this. Now these units here, they'll auto fill with water. They auto drain, these auto tilt. So you're able to get large amounts of products, say like pasta or, or other items out. They'll dump into the, into a container. And then now you're, you also have another safety aspect, which is, you know, that stuff is being dumped into something and it can be taken away rather than maybe, you know, having to scoop it out of a pot or carry pots around. The interface is also very much the same. So when they're coming to approach something like this that might be new to them, there's not really a lot of difference in, in, in interface. So they'll understand a little bit more about how to use it. They would seem like they wouldn't be, but ultimately it's not really that much different in the sense of like, you know, you have like a dry heat setting of, we'll say dry heat in the sense of like convection. You have a liquid setting, and then in this case, you'd have like a fry setting, which you, you don't really need to use, but you never know. I mean, there are instances where, you know, schools, especially when we work with Center for Literacy and things like that, there's a lot of moves towards, you know, more scratch cooking. So maybe they would want to poach things or something like that. They can certainly use this, and it is able to control that temperature very, very accurately, which means that the cooks don't necessarily have to be able to do that work. The district could very realistic. It's very realistic to say that the district could hire a consultant or somebody to run these programs and they don't have to be necessarily like, uh, you know, a full-time employee. They can be more like per diem or a consult on a consultant basis and still be able to, to do a lot of work as far as scratch cooking goes or retherm or things like that. If you notice too, that these also have the probe as well. So they're able to cook by feedback. You may have heard like cook chill or sous vide processes. Those can also be done in here because you do still have HACCP logging. So if you are using these two pieces together in conjunction, you're, you're getting those logs done automatically, with, which I can say makes things a lot easier. The fact that they also drain themselves is a key piece and that they auto, you know, if you fill, you know, if you want two gallons of water, this will put exactly two gallons of water in. They don't need to fill a bucket, transfer it over, or use a spigot. So from a safety perspective, and an accuracy perspective, it's, it's, it's pretty. And then over here, this is a little bit different, but if you're, if you're lucky enough, you can have something like this. This is a blast chiller. So to kind of round out this, this whole process here, as much as you cook, you really want to get that food down as quick as possible. Uh, a lot of times we are forced to roll things into walk-ins or we put them in ice or things like that. One, ice uh, like blanching and things like that aren't always very good because that water then seeps into our product. It can degrade the product and shorten the life. By using blast chillers, we're able to control that process. Again, you're also able to HACCP log as long as you're using uh, recipes within that. And you can batch chill. Now, what makes this particular company unique is that they actually have a function for retherm. So if your school, you know, if your, uh, your school food service offers breakfast or things like that, in the, in the beginning, you know, you're thinking like, well, the price tag is pretty high on something like this. However, there's a trade-off. I like to use the breakfast burrito analogy. So you, you know, you make all your breakfast burritos and your fillings and your things like that. You would roll them all up. You could chill them down in here or you chill all the ingredients first, you roll them, they're chilled down, held in here overnight. And then the next morning at say four o'clock in the morning, the thing is set to turn on and it'll actually re-therm all of the items in here. So it would hold them cold until they're ready, re-therm, and that allows your kitchen crew to come in a little bit later. And you know that that product is being heated to a very specific temperature. So over time, you know, labor is our big, biggest expense. If we can figure out a way to pass off some of that work and not only that, be able to reach you know, ensure quality and ensure food safety. It's kind of just wins all across the board. And this is where we're talking about that difference in, and that opportunity, I think, to change what we were doing as a, as a traditional kitchen and be able to move forward. And, and in, if we're doing it right, we're actually using less energy anyway, because we're able to combine and refine those processes. Oh, so, so that's just a few of the technologies that are out there. I think a pretty good representation of just some of the things that are available. We definitely invite you to come in. We have, I mean, that's what we do, right? We just, we geek out on equipment. <clears throat> I get to be like the resident kid in the candy store and line up a bunch of stuff and play with it. But really the goal there is to be able to uh, be that resource for you. We want to be that place where, you know, rather than searching things on the internet, or I'm sure some of you have felt like there's a solution out there that exists and I just don't know how to find it. 
I keep asking people, but they're not giving me what I need. I don't know that it, I don't know what it is, but I just know that they're not giving me that right, right information. That's really where we come in and we pride ourselves on being that like, you know, that refined search engine for food service equipment. And because we're unbiased and, and we do this testing, we've been doing it for so long. The neat thing is, is we, we really, we don't purchase any of this equipment. We're not in, you know, we're not incentivized to, to sell you something or move something like that. All the equipment we have here is in partnership with those manufacturers. And typically that kind of is a, is a great weeding out process. You know, nobody's going to really have anything here that they're, that that's really just going to be lackluster or, or typically not um, of good quality. So now I think we can get a little bit more into the induction stuff. I know Richard had spoken a little bit about walks, but I think the walks are important, I think from an induction perspective, because they do help frame the idea of how um, efficient and how potentially powerful induction can be. We're all pretty, pretty familiar, I'm sure, to some degree with what wok cooking is. You've seen somebody cooking at very high temperatures and very high heats. It's a very, very fast style of cooking. A lot of it is shallow frying, which means that you need to get temperatures up and down very, very quickly. So if you're going to shallow fry something, you know, if you even watch the videos, they're going to tempura, shallow fry something. They're going to pour that out. They're going to put the pan back on. It's a, it's a one pan meal, right? So you're using this, this thing. I, I'm a big fan of one pan meals personally in my own home because I don't want to do more dishes than I have to. But that, that it's, it's a really great example of uh, showing how something needs to really be able to move up and down in temperature. And these units here are five uh, kilowatts each. This one is three and a half. And because of that efficiency, they look unassuming, right? This looks like it would be, you know, not very powerful given its size. However, they're actually really, really powerful. I think the easiest way to usually have people understand is most people can kind of understand a gas range. If you're familiar with your residential ranges, you know, they usually top out anywhere between 15 to 25,000 BTU if you're getting a really high end one. Your commercial ranges are anywhere between, and I'm just generalizing here, about 25 to maybe 35,000 BTU at the top end. If you're using a nice one, but we, but that's, but your efficiency is only, you know, at, at best, maybe 30, 35% at, at best. So, you know, 65% of that heat is just going right out the sides and up the top. So, you know, with using something like this, you're upwards of, you know, 100,000, 120,000 BTU with the efficiency built in, assuming you're using the right pans um, and you're using the right units. So it's much more powerful and your, uh, your recovery rate is much higher because of that efficiency. You know, you can deliver that heat right back to the pan, but it's unassuming, right? In the sense that they look very, very small. This is a three and a half kilowatt unit. And I think that it's important to note that that's not always a bad thing. We, we have a tendency to want to want to specify, you know, the most powerful because we want to make sure that they have that if they need it. However, I have found even in my own personal usage of a lot of induction units, it's not always good to have the most powerful units. And that's because uh, you just might not need it. And if you're if you're giving somebody more than they need, especially with things like this, there is a tendency to actually be able to burn things or be able to like not have have issues with controlling that. So that's not a bad thing. I think it's just really dialing in and understanding why you're specifying the piece and, and what its intended use is. So if we move over here. We have kind of more traditional lineup. This is the unit I'll be cooking on today. This one is the one Richard was referring to. It's a little bit different. This is kind of a newer technology within induction. And this works a little bit more like a French top. So a French top in, in cooking, like if you're in a line cook, what's nice is you can actually move pans around. So when we're doing a lot of saute work, it's nice because you can move pans all over the place and you have different heats. You know, the heat uh, on the plate itself is varied all over and you can use really hot spot and you can use cool spots in the back to stage. I know this probably wouldn't be really applicable in maybe a school setting, However, it, it really does showcase where the technologies are going. You know, one of the challenges with induction in the past is that it's a, it is very focused, right? So wherever that, that hob is, whatever's sitting over that hob, that's kind of where that heat's going to be focused. And this is what they're moving towards to be able to make that just a little bit more dynamic. One of the other things that it makes these unique is that they're actually able to, they're getting into like modulating the frequencies. So Richard had mentioned a little bit about not being able to use aluminum. I believe it's Panasonic is the only one who has this right now. They're claiming that you can use aluminum on these certain units, but these units use a very, very high frequency. We haven't seen that as being, we don't, we haven't like road tested that. So we don't know if that high frequency has issues with, you know, how long it lasts or anything like that. But there is something to the frequency and how well it can actually make those pans work for you. So as Richard said, you know, pans do make a difference. This here is actually a steel pan. I'll be cooking my eggs in this steel pan here, which work really, really well probably in the kitchens that you'd be specifying for or using in most school kitchens, 
you'd want something that's stainless just because it's a little bit easier to cook with. And what they'll do is they'll typically clad the pans with, you know, either iron or, or even, you know, you've seen like copper quart clad pans. And it's kind of the same principle. So they'll just make them induction ready. There's obviously steel already in the pan, but what they'll do is increase that amount of steel in the bottom. So that way they're just a little bit more efficient. Over here, we can see some more traditional style units here with, you know, knobs, just like you would see with a, a typical, like a gas range or even electric range that people are more used to, like if you're cooking on a line. And then here we would see a similar style, except this is actually using a push button. So when using the push button, I can choose obviously on off. And I can choose to cook by either power or by temperature. So power is represented in like a number. Sometimes it's one through 10. I think this one is like one through 100. Or you can choose to cook by temperature. And what they're doing when they're doing that is like there's like a, a little thermistor or like a temperature sensor on the plate. And what's able to do is be able to detect that surface temperature and then understand how much, how much of that magnetic, magnetic, magnetic field is being put out and how much it's being disrupted. And then they can basically offset that and figure out what, that, what the, basically the temperature of the pot is at any given time. And it's pretty accurate. I mean, it's obviously not going to be like within a degree or something, but it's close enough to where if you're cooking, you know, stocks, one of the big challenges when using gas ranges or even electric ranges is as you're, as you're cooking stocks or soups and that volume is decreasing, you don't need as much energy to hold it at that temperature. So you start having like simmering and boiling issues. So in this case, if you can hold that within even say five degrees, you're allowing things to be able to reduce or or cook, but you're not really having to like watch it constantly and make sure that it's not just boiling over and, you know, ruining whatever that food product is. So if you don't need to be that exact, that's a perfectly, you know, fine solution. Now, if we come over here, these units, again, are kind of the same situation. They're, they're kind of a in between, right? Whereas, so we have the, the walks over there. This would be kind of the same principle in that this is um, actually 5kW per each hob. You can get these in 3 and 3.5kW as well. But what makes this unit unique is that it actually does have the ability to have a probe plugged into it so it, it can have feedback as well. So let's say you're, you know, depending on the, the style of kitchen that you're in, you know, would I recommend this for like a large commissary kitchen where you're putting large pots on it? No, it's not really designed for that. However, if you're you know, re-therming or reheating soups or stocks or things like that, or you are doing some amount of scratch cooking in like specific kitchens, this is certainly appropriate. Over here, we would have more of just a warming unit. So what's nice about these is these just are 120 volts. You can use these to stage and warm. So if, you're, if your kitchens are needing a place to either just hold items, I have a pot on here, but you can use like uh, induction ready containers as well. So those induction ready containers can just sit on here and you can keep them warm, probably for a school, maybe not like in your servery. They do make drop in units, which are certainly much safer, I think, for children than, you know, the traditional steam baths, because you don't have that issue with steam. And you're able to control that temperature in a very similar fashion. So if you need to control steam, I'm sorry, if you need to control the heat, you can do that and, and the chances of, you know, the children being hurt is it's much less or anybody for that matter. I mean, they do make drop-ins as well. So you can actually drop the, the, the items inside, just like as you would see with a normal well, and it will warm those pans from the bottom and there's like a jacket around it. So picture something like this. What makes these neat is it's the same principle, except what these are doing is these are actually soup warmers and they have the capability to re-therm on their own. So rather than say, you know, having to heat something up on your stove and then transferring it into a container. These again could also be dropped into like a well. So they would look something like this, you know, inside the table. You can have the controls on the back side. You could re-therm in the unit itself and then you can serve directly from the unit. It tells the cooks to stir it so they don't leave it alone and let it scorch or, or do whatever it is. Or, you know, it also just speeds up that, that re-therm process. Another nice thing about them is that as you take the, the, uh, the food out of the, the vessel, there's a, these both have the same thing, but there's a pressure sensor in here. So as that weight becomes lighter, it'll actually drop the warming. So it won't just continue to warm the whole, the whole thing. It'll just kind of warm closer to, to the bottom and not, you know, you don't form that like crusty burnt stuff on the units uh, on the inside. So I think with that, what we can do is I can show you a little bit about how the induction works. I'm going to use this unit here. I have it kind of pre-set up. I'm going to pull some of my, my, my supplies out here. I have them all ready to go. I'm going to hopefully be able to feed Michael. I know that there was a question about durability and you're, you know, there's probably some people saying, well, if it's so durable, why are you putting those mats on there? Well, they are durable, but that doesn't mean that I want to mess them up. <laughs> it also makes cleaning a little bit easier. They are, they are pretty durable. I don't recall. I think Richard, you did show maybe you 
showed the there's a there's a video with them dropping a bowling ball on there and it's a pretty it's a i mean it's a pretty pretty good test in the sense of you know being able to put like you know a lot of weight on there i would say you know you want to be respectful of, of any piece of equipment it's pretty tough it's a it's like a ceramic impregnated glass i've seen them get pretty abused and they're really i've never really seen them crack i mean obviously the quality of the unit it's just like you would when specifying any other piece of equipment you can specify a more heavy duty piece or you can specify a lighter duty piece obviously if you specify a light duty piece to do heavy duty work you're going to see more of an issue but what i can tell you is i mean i, I don't know if you can hear that but it definitely really doesn't sound hollow it's 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 pretty thick one of the other things they're getting much better at is field servicing so and then also speed of of swapping out so one of the night one of the nice things about using some of the smaller units is if there is an issue they actually will just send new ones and they're pretty fast i mean they'll send it within a day from a you know restaurant perspective you know that that's a this is a key piece of equipment not not you know not the size but well this is but you know any of those pieces of equipment any downtime is a real issue so the manufacturer is really really focused on making sure that that downtime is minimized so they've done that a few different ways one, the smaller pieces, they can just have them shipped out and then either, you know, local support can bring in a new item or they'll ship you a new item. Typically, they'll just start shipping it. You know, you get an RMA and they'll start shipping the new item before the old one's even sent out yet. And they're also getting much better at being able to field service a lot of these units where they can just, you know, pop out one unit and then put in another unit, plug it in, turn it on um, and keep rolling. So. I'm gonna just gonna do a little bit of, um, I'm gonna do a little omelet work today because I think that helps high, you know, kind of showcase, you know, speed and intensity. That's one of the big things when you're looking at what you wanna specify is, is controllability, especially when you start getting into more higher powered units. And that's, and that really has to do with, you know, you wanna make sure that the, you know, say the power is from, you know, one to 10, you wanna make sure that the jump from three to four is not this huge jump. And, they, and they're much better at being able to modulate that power. So, I'm just going to do a little bit of onion in here. I'm going to turn this guy up a little bit. Now, normally, if I was just doing constant, a constant amount of work, I would just leave these temperatures pretty much where they were at. But, you know, there wasn't really much of a reason to do that if we weren't using it at the moment, which is nice. So, you know, just like you would with like a normal range, you know, I can keep the, the temperature set to a very, uh, to a very stable temperature and it'll just hold at that temperature. So right now I'm just warming up a little bit of oil. I'm going to add a little bit of onion here. And hey, Mark, while you are setting up your demo, yeah. I just want to uh, mention I'm, I'm doing a little time check and I, I can tell that we're going to go a little bit past noon, particularly if we want to answer any final questions. Sure. So if anybody wants to stick with us past noon, we will, you know, we'll, we'll keep going. We, we won't go very far past noon, but I can tell we'll overshoot a little bit. And if you do have to bail out, then just know that the recording, the handouts will be on the DSA LMS system that you'll get that in your list serve and that also we will post it on the same pg e LMS where you uh, logged in today. So and we'll get that recording up pretty quickly. So if anybody has to leave, we we it's quite all right. It won't hurt our feelings. And but if you can hang out with us, hang out with us and then you'll get all the information and we'll and we'll answer your questions and back over to you, Mark. Thanks. So what you can notice here is, you know, I can touch this. I mean, it's hot, but it's not nearly as hot as say you know, if it was like a, if I was using a gas range or even uh, electric resistance range. And it's pretty gentle, pretty even in its heating. As you can see here, I don't really have any hot spots. Eggs are a pretty good indicator of something like that. That's why we, that's why we like to use eggs. Our onions get a little bit of color. I'm really able to do like a lot of gentle saute work. Now, if I turn this thing up, it'll definitely meet, meet my, meet my demand, no problem. But it's just really not necessary. It's actually more important, I think, to showcase control. You know, as being an older cook now, restraint is kind of key. But that's also really important if you have like a, a lot of people working in your kitchen. You want to make sure that your platforms are, are pretty. And the induction provides that. Another issue uh, a lot of people bring up is the concern about, well, on my gas range, I can tell what the temperature is. I, I kind of feel like I'm a little bit disconnected from that when using induction. Like, how do I know, you know, what the current state of the, of the, you know, I can't see a flame. And what I can say is actually after a while, what you do, and I've, and I've done a lot of this work with just like cooks that I've trained in the past that were all, I mean, I was raised on a, on a gas range myself, my good, like pretty much my, a good portion of my career. And you do get used to using that, that, that gas, that is your reference. But what ends up happening is because the induction is pretty stable, 
it's actually not really that hard because once you learn knob positions and remember where they are, especially if you're doing like a lot of line work or just even, you know, everyday cooking, you just start to remember where those knob positions are. And because it's so stable, there's not really a question of, of what, you know, what that temperature is going to be. You, you just remember that you just memorize it. I mean, because the, a lot of times the processes themselves are a little bit, are, are, are basically the same kind of like six processes over and over and over again. As you can see here, it's, it's pretty gentle. I always like watching Mark do the demos because I'm an omelet lover and I, I'm trying to up my <laughs> omelet game. And <laughs> I noticed one of, one of the things that uh, Mark does is he kind of fluffs the eggs a little bit just as they're starting to harden up. The other thing is when I make omelets at home, I pull out my portable induction unit because I find that I just get so much more even cook and I don't get, you know, the sort of odd browning I get on my gas range and I get a lot less sticking on the edges of the pan because there's not all that waste heat coming up the side of the pan. So it, it, right. I, I, it's a really good way to make omelets. <laughs> so, so the nice thing is I can just slide it over here. The unit is not consuming any power when it's not on. So there's no pan there. I don't have the back ones on right now, but as you can see, I mean, it's hot, sure, but it's definitely not as hot as if I was using, you know, a, a, a raw flame there. Yeah, so, and you're not going to catch anything on fire. So, as you can see here, pretty gentle. I'm going to try and do this for the camera. Definitely got to work on my work on my color with this, this unit a little bit. So, I try to use different units each time, you know, to keep myself humble. But the goal there is obviously just to show that it, it can be done and it's pretty gentle, right? There's not really a lot of, a lot of like guesswork in it. It's not much different than say your, it's not much different than say your, you know, your, your typical gas range tops or anything like that. It doesn't really take much more to understand how they work and, and, and the intricacies involved in, in, in the technology, say from gas to induction, it's not, it's not that far off. Does anybody have any questions? We get anything? So far, I'm not seeing any, Mark. And yeah, let's let's maybe wrap up with our, our utility resources. Thank you so much for the for the demo. Now I'm hungry. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much. And we will have one at the very tail end. We'll we'll leave some space for questions. So if questions pop in your mind, type them in, and we will uh, keep moving forward. And by the way, Mark, thank you so much for answering the maintenance question, because that was. One, we didn't adequately answer that question earlier when the, somebody asked about maintenance on induction and 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 they were worried that you're going to have to re replace your induction cooktop every couple of years like a phone. And, and no, I didn't mean to imply that. What I meant to imply was a gas range lasts a thousand years. The induction range, I don't know, 10 years, 15 in a school kitchen, it might last 20, right? It, the notion is it won't last as long as the gas range because the gas range is such a simple piece. But as you said, these are built for um, commercial use and the system is built to replace them if they need to. So all, all good stuff. So let me go back over and share my slides and let's see, here we go. All right, it's so much more fun watching Mark than, than me, but you know, back, you got me back again. So we'll just, we'll just round out this section with some utility resources. These are the money slides. This is the, you know, there are dollars to help you out. We want to help you move forward. pg e wants to help you move forward, get the, the efficient and all electric kitchen that you want. So let's talk some of these utility resources here real quick. And the first thing I want to point everybody to is our statewide California Energy Wise site. And this site has all of our rebates, our seminars, webinars, our, our services, all this kind of good stuff. So let's talk about that. If you have a uh, kitchen, an existing school kitchen, an existing facility, you're building a new facility and you want an energy survey, contact us. We've done, we've walked through hundreds of schools. We know a lot about school kitchens. We can help you answer questions, look for ways to save energy, both from equipment and operations. Then we also have the Try Before You Buy program, which is essentially doing a live demo with Chef Mark over here. So you're like, oh, I'm doing a new kitchen. I want to buy a Rationale Combi. I want to buy a 
a garland induction cooktop. You come in and work with Mark in our demo facility. And down in Southern California, the Edison SoCal Gas can also set you up with demos, right? So contact us. Let's get your hands on the equipment. And as I said, we've got, you know, a full on lineup of induction technologies as well as all this other high tech stuff. Come in and work side by side with Mark and yeah, and he'll he'll cook you an omelet so you don't have to eat a virtual omelet. Also, for all my designers, architects, everybody, we have design guides on there for hot water systems, for kitchen ventilation, equipment rebates I'll talk about in a moment. We have ROI cost calculators that are very simple to use and directly relate to the rebates. So if you need to, you know, justify buying an efficient piece of equipment, that's the easiest way to do it. We have a report library, once again, for designer specifiers, equipment that we've tested in our lab. You can pull down these research reports and look at them and get some real numbers. And then we run a whole seminar program. We do seminars on hot water, kitchen ventilation, all these other things that we talked about today that are, are bigger picture issues for your school kitchens. And we continue to put up new subjects. You can go back and watch the old ones. They're all that you can stream them and just just take advantage of that. There's a lot of time and effort that goes into this. It's all specific to commercial kitchens. It's all the, the latest, newest information from the world's experts, all free. So so please take advantage of it. And I want to mention that we I, I said we do a lot of training. We have a plant forward culinary workshop coming up with the Center for Eco Literacy. That's September, September 28th, 29th and 30th we'll we'll run one every day chef mark will be part of this it's a very good you know opportunity for you to connect your food service workers with some real expertise and move your program towards scratch cooking and get some real resources i hopefully everybody's already aware of the center for eco literacy uh, i know they work with school districts all over california and almost everybody i talk to is, is already knows them and here's sort of the blurb you know it's a it's the plant forward culinary workshop there'll be 90 minute trainings one each each of the three days they're really designed for your school nutrition staff it's not so much for the food service directors they are welcome to join but this is really the the sort of hands-on direct skills you know training to get to the to the nutrition staff. So they learn about plant forward meals, cooking techniques. Mark is going to, you know, he teaches knife skills, all this kind of stuff. And the whole thing is how do we get those fresh, flavorful dishes, you know, using our, our bounty of California and get that to our school kids. And as I said, you know, everybody can register. Uh, and we have the ability to train loads and loads of people over those three days. Please pass this information. This link at the top is information and registration. Please pass that to your food service directors and staff. This is a rare opportunity to get this kind of training and we want to bring on as many people as possible. And then I want to talk about something that's really, really cool. And this is the uh, brand new California Food Service Instant Rebates Program. So the problem with rebates, particularly in a school setting, is you buy the piece of equipment, then somebody's got to go fill out the rebate form, look up the account number, blah, blah, blah. And so the rebates don't uh, get taken and the money just sits there, which is crazy because the money is belongs to ratepayers. It's, it's essentially your money. So what the, what the utilities decided and the, and the utilities commission decided is to put together a statewide instant rebate program that would simplify this process and encourage people to buy more efficient equipment and help, help cover that extra capital cost for the more efficient or the higher tech pieces of equipment. And it's so super simple. All you do is you find a, a dealer, which we, we're working you know, with all the dealers in California to try and get everybody signed up. Then you purchase a qualifying product, which you can find the whole list. I'll, I'll give you the link to that one. And you get the instant rebate. You don't have to fill out any paperwork or anything. It's the rebates right there on the invoice. Um, and, the, and you go to California Energy Wise Instant Rebates. The qualified products list is there. It's just a spreadsheet. You can find your favorite manufacturers. You can see the rebate amounts. And the rebate amounts are pretty stunning. If we look at things like a combination oven, which we've been talking about a lot today, you can see we're, you know, it's 1,500 to 3,000 bucks, right? So when you when you need to justify buying these more high tech pieces of equipment and somebody's going like, no, I'll just go buy a cheap convection oven and say like, well, hey, we can get, you know, $3,000 rebate if we just buy it from the right folks. So huge, huge ability to, you know, get savings there. Please take advantage of that, right? So yeah, combi ovens, there are gas and electric uh, savings. Remember I told you right now today, it's a great way to cut your carbon if you have an existing facility and your old convection oven dies. For God's sake, go out and buy a you know a high efficiency gas convection oven. You get 750 bucks, covers that cost, and it is cost neutral. The energy savings will 
pay for the piece of equipment and you cut your carbon in half. Okay, so easy program to use a huge number of pieces of equipment that are rebated, rebates higher than we've ever had before and much easier than ever before to get it. And, you know, it, you only have a couple of, you know, things that you have to follow, which is essentially your, your non-residential commercial, all schools are going to be a commercial account. And you have to put in the equipment in the same location as your utility account. So you go and buy, you know, an, an oven for a school in Oakland, the oven has to go into the school in Oakland. It's super simple. It's totally logical. And that's what you're going to do anyway. And the program runs all up and down California. It's a statewide program. And if you have any questions at all, there's a hotline to call and, you know, here's an email, right? And we will help you. There's an army of folks waiting to help you get this equipment. So please take advantage of that. We'll help you find the dealer, help you find the products, confirm that you're eligible, you know, contact us, contact us. There are great resources. And if you have any projects at all, you know, here's the, here's the gold. You can, you can, here's a direct phone number and direct emails from Mark, Todd Bell, who does most of our site energy surveys and myself. Okay. Contact us. Let us help you with your projects. Now, before we completely tail off here, I'd like everybody to pull up that short survey. It was in your, it was initially in your question box. And if you can pull that up, it's, it is such a fast survey and it's one of our deliverables. We really need everybody to do it. And it basically just asks you, you know, did you learn something? And is there something you'd like for us to put together for you in the future? So if you will go ahead and do that, and it should be, I believe it was underneath the published questions. Yeah, right, right at the very top, you'll find the handouts and you will find a survey monkey link for the survey. And the, and the survey is anonymous. We don't know who did it and we don't share this with anybody. It really is just to help us figure out how to make our programs better. So if everybody will do that for me, I'm going to go to this next slide. And I think I'm going to the next slide. There we go. This is our final question slide. So I'm going to scroll down here and see. Oh, yes. Thank you, Laurel has, has reposted these. Let's see if there's any, any other new questions. Let's see. There was a question. Oh, there was a question about when will DSA require all electric kitchens? That's an Ida question, and I don't know if Ida wants to come back on and answer that one or not. Ida, sure. are you still there? I yes. am. Thank you, Richard. You can hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right. So the California Energy Commission establishes energy policy for the state of California. So technically, while we address Cal Green and sustainability, energy policy is set by the Energy Commission. They are meeting the governor's targets of uh, net zero by 2030 and uh, net carbon by 2045 in their energy code and as they are developed. It's a public process, so your engagement is important. In fact, I just mentioned earlier today that the 2022 energy efficiency standards for non-residential buildings were just passed by the Energy Commission and will be presented to Building Standards Commission later this year for the effective date of January 1st, 2023, which is on the way to building electrification for HVAC and lighting systems. Other end uses are not yet addressed. So essentially cooking is not yet addressed at in, in the energy policy right now, but in getting to net zero, eventually it will be addressed with future editions of the energy code. Our goal at DSA in addressing Cal Green and addressing sustainability is really to pr bring presentations like this to you today so that you can prepare for when those changes happen. And they should be, you should be considering it now for any improvement that you do because you know your facilities will be lasting a long time. As Richard stated, this information and equipment is available now. So if you are having any of these projects moving forward, it's always a good idea to think of the future. Obviously, as our renewable energies grow and people move away from, from gas systems, there'll be a shift, I think, in cost in the sense of gas will become more expensive because there'll be less people on the system to maintain it. So this is this is the wave of the future, but DSA, you know, does not have the authority to ban gas appliances or ban electric kitchens. Energy policy is set by Energy Commission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would assume the right the moment the municipal regulations are the ones the municipal electric reach codes are the ones that are most important. So let's say you're at UC Berkeley and you're building a new facility. The Berkeley reach code would mandate all electric. So, and, and as Ida said, you know, you know, it's going to happen. You don't want to be the person who said, well, oh man, I'm so proud because I snuck a gas line into my college kitchen. That may seem like a great thing that, you know, like 
today, but 10 years from now, you're going to be like, I'm the guy who snuck the gas line into the you know kitchen while everybody else is all electric. So your kitchen's last, go ahead, plan for it, do it now. It's it's going to be easiest for, for education institutions anyway, right? This, this you guys, it's kind of a no brainer for you. Richard, um, I do want to yes. click. I do want to clarify that schools are not subject to local energy policy or energy directives. I will okay. say, however, we encourage you to do so just because obviously schools educate the future of our children. If your local jurisdiction determines that it is important for the entire city to move into an electric, I mean, a gas free environment, that school should also take notice of that because the kids will be watching and they should be, you should be part of that educational process. So we encourage that a schools, if the local mandates do direct more restrictive policy to incorporate them in their projects, but technically they are subject to our authority under the state and are not subject to local directives with regard mm -hmm. to that. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, good. Thank you, Ida. And, that, that, and, and so to get back to the Berkeley example, which is a great example, we have been working with Berkeley on the reusables ordinance that they have. So it's not kitchen electrification, but it's a waste side. And same thing, the city of Berkeley has a reu reusable ordinance for commercial food service. And the school district is saying, well, we should try and see if we can match this. So, so they're already, uh, so now I've learned, you know, essentially voluntarily trying to step forward with this and we're trying to help them work out some of the technical and labor issues. So good to know. There was another question. It was, can a steamer be used without a hood? You really should put the steamer under a hood because you're going to create a lot of moisture as you open the door, but you're saying that you have a combination oven. Well, guess what? You can steam in the combination oven. So if you only have a small hood, maybe you're stacking two combination ovens and then you have your induction cooktop, right? So that's the way to beat that one. It was, we'll see, it was Lee's asking about, it looks like hassle load. I think what uh, you're thinking about is HACCP, which is hazard analysis and critical control points. That is a safety, food safety protocol that you use in commercial kitchens to make sure that you don't poison anybody. And it requires taking notes and writing down temperatures and times and all this kind of stuff. And these new pieces of equipment can automatically do that. So that's great for schools. It's labor savings because if, you know, some kid comes home and says, oh, I got food poisoning and, and they go back to the school and say, did you poison my kid? No, we can show you, you know, that the food was cooked at the right temperature. It was held at the right temperature, et cetera. The food poisoning must have come from the donut shop that the kid went to after school. Let's see, our replacement components, parts widely available through most vendors for induction kitchen equipment. Yeah, I mean, the, the vendors are people like Garland, Voldrath, CookTech, they're major vendors. So they're, they're, these are people who play big in the industry. And the, and the chef was on the garland. That's what he was using. It's the full-size garland induction cooktop. Let's see, are there, let's see, are the standalone equipment hardwired or plug-in or both? Yeah, you could do it. You know, the ones that are the higher KW, you could hardwire them, you can plug them in. It really depends on your electrical setup. So yeah, it can go, it can go both ways. Were there other questions for Ida? I feel like somebody had asked earlier if Ida was going to hang around. And let's see, uh, I Ida's, yeah, go ahead. I think we had some ventilation questions and just wanted to state that moving to an all electric kitchen does not necessarily mean that the exhaust hood may be omitted from kitchen designs. Ventilation is still required as we had, as you had mentioned, Richard. The ventilation exhaust design is dependent upon the type of equipment located underneath it and is often customized for each kitchen. So, and each kit equipment layout. So future upgrades, we'll always have to look at the ventilation exhaust system design because it would it needs to be responsive to what's provided in the equipment. And exactly. then uh, we already discussed fire suppression, which of course, if you're cooking with grease is still required. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you know, one thing we didn't really talk much about was these, well, I guess I touched on it early, these high speed ovens, which, you know, you see those in, you see, you know, you're feeding a bucket load of people in your local Starbucks little breakfast sandwiches and kind of cook to order stuff, uh, a couple of these high speed ovens could be a little tool that could that could go in as well. And those can operate ventless. They can sit outside of an, an exhaust hood. You still have to deal with the waste heat. They're still uh, creating heat into the space. So you have to have AC, but you know, that's another tool. So once again, talk to us, you know, catch up with us. Let's see and link to the video. The videos, as I said, will be posted on the LMS systems. And I see Ida's email address. That's going to be up to her if she wants to give the email address away. <laughs> I'm not going to give it's, it's all over the it's all over the website, so they know. Okay, great. 
Great. And I do want to say that if any of you want to see more information coming from DSA that is specific to schools for any technological advancements that are coming the way, your way to get to zero net energy and zero carbon, reach out to us. We will reach out to providers and we will find those individuals as PG&E and Frontier Energy have done to bring that content and information to you. That's catered specifically to you. We want to be an active partner in making, getting all of you into your zero net energy and zero carbon goals. And so I just wanted to make that push too. Yeah, excellent. Well, I'm going to make a call. We have, you know, used everybody's time wisely. and We've actually given, you know, taken another 15, 17 minutes of everybody's time for which we are exceptionally grateful. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Ida, for joining us today. I feel really privileged you know, to have you on the line with us. And also thank you for inviting us to speak to your, you know, your school folks. Thanks to Chef Mark for joining and doing the demo. Michael Cars, Kiana for setting things up. Laurel for setting things up on the DSA side. Everybody, this has been quite the effort to bring this to you. And I think it really came off well. And we hope to see you again in future classes. Contact us, use the information, use the rebates. There's just so much ability to help you guys out and go forward and decarbonize, okay? Because remember, that's our mission, cutting carbon. So let's do it. Everybody take care, have a great day, and we will catch up with you next time. Thanks. Thank you.